All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our Cross Labs workshop, Creativity Unleashed. Today is our fifth and final session, and we're going to be talking about the creativity of biological evolution and creative embodiment. It's really exciting, and uh, we can't wait for our session today. So because this is our last session, I also wanted to say a few words about the other things that we have at Cross Labs. So we also have a lot of really exciting opportunities for those who are interested in working with us. We have some fellow uh, fellowship positions open. We also have some internships open and we have all sorts of collaboration opportunities for all of the topics that we covered today and in our previous sessions. So please, we encourage you to go to our website, uh, crosslabs.org and we're going to be posting all of our opportunities there. So please check us out and you can also see more information on our Twitter page as well. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and share some slides. All right. Right, Creativity Unleashed, what, creativity, what creative technologies would, could, and shouldn't be. But like I said, this is our fifth session. We are here and we're talking about creative embodiment and the creative brilliance of nature and biological evolution. So either you're seeing this on YouTube live right now or you're seeing the recording some other time in the future, which is really cool. Technology. All right, so um, I highly recommend that you check out our previous sessions from this week's workshop. They're all posted on our YouTube page right here, Cross Labs AI. Um, and go ahead and give us a like and subscribe for more content that we put out. Because we also do a monthly crossroads where we invite speakers from all sorts of backgrounds and perspectives to talk about all sorts of interesting topics as well. We also do a podcast on my mind, and we also uh, encourage you to check that out as well. So if you subscribe, you'll get notifications about all of our exciting things. All right, so today's session, creative embodiment and the creative brilliance of nature. So the idea behind this session is, well, we've talked a lot about the what creativity is from a psychology point of view, but also all sorts of other point of view about like, you know, what is creativity? And we also talked about um, what cre how creativities interact with our own human creative processes and how to make that better and, you know, what we should design for the future. We also talked about indeterminacy and trying to understand different ways of understanding and communicating. And then, of course, the ethics and uh, unpacking what it, it, it's how we're being impacted on a day to day basis in our lives uh, with all sorts of creative technologies. So for today's final session, I thought it would be really cool if we talked about evolution because biological evolution is continuously generating an endless number of bodies and structures many of which are functional solutions to problems. Some of these problems are, are introduced by the environment, some of them internal, uh, internally, some of them are a mix of both. So how can we better understand biological creativity as a process that generates creative solutions to environmental problems while also understanding the relationship between embodiment and the capacity and expression for creativity? So I think we're going to have a lot of fun talking about this because we've got a bunch of speakers lined up. We've got Josh Bongard, Fatima Nozuri, we've got Nick Cheney, Tim Taylor, and Takashi Ikegami. So the format is going to be like this. Every speaker is going to give about a five or 10 minute talk with slides or without slides, or maybe just sharing some ideas. And then after that, we're going to give about a 10 minute, about 10 minutes for discussion about that topic and the ideas that they presented. We're also going to take about a 15 minute break about an hour after we have done some uh, idea sharing and discussion. We're going to do uh, come back and have the rest of the speakers and then finish it up with an open discussion. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my slides here. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker today. So we have Tim Taylor who's a scientist, author, and coder of artificial life technology, who does all sorts of really fun, exciting, interesting things in interdisciplinary fields. And today he's going to be talking about living space, environments suitable for open-ended evolution of creative behaviors. So without further ado, I'm now going to pass it over to you, Tim. 
Thanks very much, Elisa. Let me just try and share my screen. Uh, that's... Okay, can you, you can see that, yeah. Okay, so I, I want to talk, uh, say a few words about substrates, uh, sort of environments, artificial environments um, that are suitable for the open-ended evolution of creative behaviors. Um, and I want to concentrate on this question of what exactly is a behavior anyway? If we look at some traditional artificial ecology systems like Tierra or Ecosim or a whole number of other ones, um, you can see that they're generally written in a, a language um, or a control um, uh, a, a control system where individual elements of those languages have a direct meaning, uh, direct semantics. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the syntax of the controller um, and the semantics, what that, what that piece of code is supposed to do. And so just by looking at the programming language of these controllers, you can get a fairly good idea of the general kinds of behaviors that might evolve. So they're traditional artificial ecologies. More interesting are soft artificial life systems uh, where there's a physics simulation, um, uh, obviously started by uh, Carl Sims's favorite work and all sorts of um, other interesting work uh, since then. But in these systems, you tend to get much more interesting, unexpected behaviors evolving. Um, and then we can go a step further and look at um, artificial evolution in actual physical hardware. So hard artificial life systems. Uh, here are a few examples. I don't know, is it just me? It just seems not many people are doing artificial evolution in, in physical systems these days. Um, I'll just mention Adrian Thompson's work because I don't know if all of you will be familiar with it. He evolved uh, circuits in a field programmable gateway, gate array. Um, he was trying to evolve a circuit that could discriminate between different frequencies of sound. And his circuits were able to do that after they'd evolved. And so he analyzed what had actually evolved to see uh, how they were doing the task they'd been set. And this diagram at the top is a wiring diagram from inputs to outputs, showing all of the uh, all of the gates in the gate array that were wired together from input to output. Uh, he then went through each of these gates, each of these squares in the array, and clamped each one individually um, so that it wasn't playing any role um, in the processing from input to output. In, in order to define the minimum set of these arrays, of, the, of these gates that were actually involved um, in, the, uh, in the processing from input to output. What was interesting there is that in this bottom uh, diagram, he, th so these are the gates that were actually playing a part in transforming the input to the output uh, of this system. These gray squares here were interesting because they're not actually connected to anything else. So looking at it from a human designer's point of view, for treating this as a digital system, um, they shouldn't be have playing any part in the input to output processing. And yet, if he clamped one of these gray squares, then the system didn't work as intended. So there was obviously some unexpected analog interference going on between uh, these gray gates and the ones which were actually connected, uh, which was couldn't be described in a, uh, a analyzing the system in a digital point of view, but was nevertheless having some some analog influence, some unexpected influence on the system. And so evolution let loose on this piece of electronics was treating the system as it is uh, an analog device rather than what it had been designed to be um, for human designers uh, in 
in terms of a digital system. So those are some examples from artificial systems. Um, so even more interesting when you start to get physics involved. So what's going on with these? What are the differences and similarities between these different kinds of substrates? I think it's interesting to consider actions in biological systems um, to get some better insight into this question. So let's look at bird flight. So bird flight involves a physical structure uh, interacting with the laws of physics or aerodynamics. So that um, produces uplift uh, when the wings um, uh, are um, subjected to airflow. And then, of course, this isn't just any old physical structure. This is a very finely tuned, specific physical structure um, generated from genetic information that has been evolved over millions of years to perform this very specific function. And so I like the word contrivance to describe these physical structures, wings in this example, because that brings about the idea that these are very, very specific, unlikely structures. It's not something you would see in nature um, or in, in the physical world, the non-biological world. Um, it's a very specific structure that has been defined or evolved for a very specific function or interaction to produce a specific outcome. And so the overall effect of all of these things combined is there's a change of state of the structure um, that, and of the environment itself. Uh, and that's brought about by the interaction of the physical structure with the laws of physics. Just looking at one other example, let's look at the human auditory system. So here again, you have a very complex physical structure that's interacting with the, with the laws of physics, acoustics, electrochemistry. Um, and again, it's, um, it's a very complicated structure that is in, uh, built according to genetic information that has been evolved over millions of years. Um, and I mean, just the intricacy of the system is mind blowing. Uh, some of the main things that are happening is that the outer ear is funneling the sound, incoming sound waves, and also dissipating a lot of their energy. Otherwise, when those sound waves got concentrated on the eardrum, it would sort of explode the eardrum. Um, so there's energy dissipation going on. Then when it reaches the inner ear um, and the cochlea, the sound wave tr travels down the cochlea, this spiral shape. Um, and there's a membrane within this called the basilar membrane, uh, which varies along its length as it goes around the spiral um, in terms of its physical dimensions and its uh, elasticity. Uh, and that's very specifically designed so that incoming sound waves of particular frequencies will produce resonant frequencies at particular spatial positions along the membrane. And then when that happens, uh, we've got a, a closer a close up at the bottom here. Um, at, at the particular point where there's a resonant frequency, the, the membrane will move up and these hair cells above it uh, will be pushed against this tectorial membrane above and that's going to flex the hair cells, which then causes a series of chemical transitions within the hair cells, uh, which produces an electrical signal, which then travels along the nerve cell. And so, again, it's this really, really complex physical structure contrivance that's evolved over millions of years to interact with the laws of physics in a uh, very, very specific way to produce a, a very specific change in state in structure and also incidentally really uh, in, in its environment. So we can ask what are the common descriptions, can we have a common description of these kinds of behaviours in physics mediated environments? In recent, a couple of recent publications I've uh, suggested this uh, parameter organisation action uh, point of view to as a general description of what's happening. Um, this is my first attempt. 
I've decided to reword this slightly because parameter organization action doesn't really give a sense of the interaction between the structure and its environment. So uh, it's not just a an isolated system um, with nothing else going on, but it's, an, it's a system that's interacting with the environment mediated by the laws of physics. And so I think it's maybe better to call it the parameter structure interaction view or psi. So you've got genetically evolved parameters which are creating very specific structures in structure space, which by uh, interacting with the laws, global laws of physics or dynamics of the system um, lead to changes in state of structure and environments and very specific changes of, of state as evolved um, through the process of evolution. Okay, and just as an aside really, this concentrating on interactions um, between objects in the system mediated by global laws uh, is resonant with what you might call relational approaches to understanding the world. So physicist Carlo Rovelli and, and others um, have recently been putting forward a, a relational interpretation of quantum dynamics. But this, these relational approaches to understanding the world date back a very long way um, in Western philosophy and in Buddhism, Buddhism too. So just for wrapping up, um, Recently, the physicist and writer Samuel Arbusman uh, wrote an article um, where he suggested using the term emergent microcosm to describe virtual worlds where, that are capable of unspooling entire emergent computational cosmoses. So he used this term to describe systems including physics simulations, falling sand games, and cellular automata, amongst others. And he says, ultimately, I would love an articulation of the different elementary particles and rule sets that can allow these microcosms to arise. Now, of course, that's exactly what we're trying to do in the study of open-ended evolution and evolutionary creativity. Um, so the side view and I think other work in requirements for open-ended evolution can provide guidelines uh, for these design requirements for emergence microcosms. One important property seems to be what I call connectedness. Uh, and that is the property that um, the state of an object in the environment is affected by the state of objects of, uh, of, of neighboring objects in the environment. And having this connectedness leads to the possibility of chain reactions and unexpected and complex ramifications in states and dynamics. So thinking back to those early artificial ecologies where you had a one-to-one -one mapping between um, syntax and semantics in the language. In these connected systems, you might have all sorts of unexpected chain reactions happening. Uh, and I think that is, to some extent, the source of creativity and unexpected behaviors in evolutionary systems. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, uh, but uh, just for discussion, uh, we might think about what are other important design requirements for emergent microcosms. Um, I chuck in a couple of, uh, of suggestions from myself, uh, conservation rules, um, and also possibly multifunctionality, different domains of interaction, um, which might be useful from evolutionary perspective. Uh, but hopefully we can have a nice discussion about that. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thanks a ton. That's great. Um, yeah, so I guess we can just open it up for discussion. So um, anybody who wants to, anybody who has a question or a comment, please go ahead and um, just jump right in. And of course, to, to get things started, um, I, I can also start. Um, so uh, I, I really like this parameter, um, uh, 
was it? Um, <laughs> Sorry, I've changed it now. So, <laughs> just <laughs> yeah. to confuse you. <laughs> <laughs> Parameter object interaction space now. Uh, er, yeah, interaction space. I think it's I think it's really important to talk about uh, interactions happening between objects, and I think maybe one of the the things that we had talked about a couple sessions ago in Shash uh, Shash and Wei's talk about because we he talked a lot about interactions as well. And I think a point that overlaps here is um, in these interactions, the object and the verb, or, or in other words, what exactly is interacting is actually defined during the interaction or also something that uh, like vocabulary and language and symbols that define the interaction are, are basically being defined uh, dynamically. So I, I don't, it's not necessarily a question. It, it's just a comment that um, I noticed overlap there. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, it, it is uh, definitely that that's, uh, I've not thought so much about the um, case of linguistics, but um, yeah, no, I, I think there, there are commonalities there for sure. Um, and you know, it, it's really just trying to get away from this Thing, which is maybe not so common now, but it was an earlier artificial life work of, of having um, systems where you would have agents moving around and they could have like one of a range of interactions like move forward or like eat object or collect energy. And so basically all of the things that they could do was were already predefined. So there was a predefined world of semantics, if you will, if you will. Um, and whereas if you're evolving something in a physical environment, whether it's a real world or simulated physics, uh, there's much more potential for uh, something unexpected to happen. And actually one more thing, I think it's interesting to, to think about the differences between physics simulations, so Newtonian physics simulations, and cellular automata. Um, they both have this property of connectedness and this potential for chain reactions and ramifications. So you make one change and then a whole load of other things change, uh, which then could be a, a starting point for an evolutionary process to, to produce some useful change. Um, but they're different. Um, so I don't know if Bert, uh, I don't think Bert's joining us, but Chan, but um, his, his lovely work with Linea is fantastic. Um, but it doesn't have, so one of the things it doesn't have is conservation of matter or um, it doesn't have ideas of energy. And it seems to me for evolving agents of self-replicating uh systems you're really going to need conservation of something otherwise uh it, it's hard to see what yeah you you get these patterns evolving but um which might be useful in their own right but in terms of open-ended evolution where we're understanding evolution as um uh, akin to biological evolution uh i suspect that some form of conservation of matter and energy will be required. So I, I have a question also. If, so I'm, what, what, what like it, it's called PSI, what was the S for again? Structure. The reason I change, I, so I used to have organization and I changed it to structure. That was purely because, um, well, the acronym sounded better, but also, um, in works like orthopoiesis, they have very specific um, definitions of structures and organizations. And so structure is a kind of static thing and organization might be dynamically changing over time. So I wanted to distinguish the, the static structure that is generated from the genetic information, which then interacts and kind of acts as an initial condition or constraint upon physics um, being applied to that structure. So the, the dynamics actually comes from the 
global laws of physics. And this structure is acting as a constraint to produce a particular outcome um, that's been honed by evolution. So, because you also mentioned the cellular automata, is the glider a PSI or not? Um, it, yes, it is. I mean, so PSI, I, I don't know if I say a, PSI is just a view, a, a way of looking at and analyzing these systems. And it is. Um, but as I was just saying, I think there are other things as well. So this is just one requirement, I would suggest, of a, an emergent microcosm. Um, but there are other things too. And so I suggested conservation of, of matter and energy might be other important factors. And of course, that's missing in cellular automata. Yeah, so you would, so you're kind of looking to maybe extend the, the definitions or like to kind of ensure these things as well. Is this right? Yeah, I, I mean, I think, so, I mean, Bert Chan's latest, one of his latest papers, he was trying to implement open-ended evolution um, in linear, but he he came across the, the, the sorts of dynamics that nearly everyone finds when they try to do this in artificial systems, and that you get a like interesting load of evolutionary things happening initially, but then it just seems to settle down to a stable state. And it's there that I think you need to start considering other factors about evolutionary biology um, uh, and evolutionary ecology, such as food webs and um, relations, how how things are continually changing, the adaptive plan state is, is continually changing, um, which involves maybe one species being a, a resource for another species. But, but if you don't have conserved matter, if the, the organisms don't have to actually go out and collect matter to make a, um, an offspring, um, then there's no need for them to go and chase after and kill another organism. So there are all sorts of things like that where I think connectedness again, sorry, uh, conservation of matter again reinforces this connectedness between everything in the system. Mm, okay. okay. Um, I still have one more question. <laughs> Sure. So in the in this also like it, let's let's stick to linear and cellular automata. So what what is the parameterization? I mean that's kind of maybe what I'm mostly wondering about. Where because like maybe it's still missing also the parameterization, or is there some parameterization? Like... Yes, yeah. So that's interesting. Um, with linear, as with most attempts at applying evolution to cellular automata, what is actually being evolved are the kernels, um, so basically the update rules um, for the local environment of an organism. Um, now, that it's always struck me as a bit strange if you're trying to implement open-ended evolution in that kind of system. Mm -hmm. I did some work a while ago, 2004 or six, I think, on a system called Evoker, which was doing something slightly different. But what happens in linear and most other systems like that, yeah, you're, you're encoding update rules. But to me, that seems like you're encoding the rules of physics. So you're actually evolving the local rules of physics, um, which, so, and I just can't process what that means in terms of uh, of open-ended evolution. Um, so what I did in Evoker uh, was evolved, I tried to evolve local patterns within the environment, and it was a game of life environment, but I, I was evolving specific starting positions, which then got interacted and updated by the, the usual laws of physics. I wasn't doing anything to change the laws of physics, but I was trying to produce particular outcomes by creating 
particular initial conditions within a fixed laws of physics. So that's what I did. Most people don't do that though. Most people do the uh, evolving the update rules themselves, evolving the rules of physics. Yeah, I think that's a bit weird. It doesn't, doesn't seem to really have something to do with the structures necessarily inside. I mean, like of course it determines them, but you can't point at them like they don't. Like, the dynamic yeah. was, uh, like the, these structures inside they are their individuality is kind of invisible to the local rules in some way. I guess. Like, yeah. I guess, sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. and so yeah, it. it it produces these really beautiful dynamics, but I, I just don't know how to interpret them in terms of, of an evolutionary system. So I think uh, it, just to make sure that we, that we get a chance to go um, and uh, visit everyone's uh, talks and, and things, I think unfortunately we're gonna have to put a pause on this discussion, but we can absolutely come back to it. Um, and I, I was going to say one thing that uh, Shinwei was bringing up, but I think we'll we'll save it. I, I can read one out loud for the um, for the YouTube channel, uh, but I'm going to uh, say that we put a pin in it, and then I'll I'll read them later. Uh, so one thing that he had said was other senses of connectedness from Longo, Monteville, Gould, et al. How the object evolves in relation to its milieu. 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 Uh, sorry, uh, co-articulates the realm of potentials for both the entity and its milieu. M milieu. Also, Whitehead, um, how an object becomes uh, how an object becomes constitutes what the object is. So those are super interesting things. I wanted to share them with we with, with us all. Um, we're definitely going to come back to that. Um, so, but uh, for now, uh, let's hear from let's hear from Josh, and he's going to. Uh, share some really interesting things about his his work on um, uh, uh, soft body robots and evolutionary uh, evolutionary robotics, evolutionary computation, and physical simulation. So he runs the Morphology, Evolution, and Cognition Lab, whose work focuses on the role that morphology and evolution play in cognition. And he, today he's going to talk about AI design robots, xenobots, and metamaterials. So with that, um, Josh, Josh Bongard, it's uh, floor is all yours. Thanks very much, Alyssa. Um, I seem to have be having an issue sharing my screen. I'm getting a can't share your screen message. Should go. It should be gone now. Oh, okay. We're getting the same issue. Oops. Let me press the button a couple more times. Let me remove this co-host and I'll add you again. Okay. okay. Try, try again. Okay. Still getting the same issue. Mm -hmm. Is it a permissions issue from the um, from the browser, or is it? Could it... be. My apologies. Give me one moment here to see if I can resolve this. Sure, no problem. And uh, so for everybody who is participating, um, I will also copy the chat here and then I'll put it into the, um, the, the our workshop, our, sorry, our workshops discord. That way all the points are recorded. Lisa, could I ask you to share your screen and um, maybe present, uh, present this uh, slide deck? Would that be okay? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Try that. Yeah, let's try that here. Happy to do so. I'm going to. All right. One second. It's loading here. And... Thank you, Alyssa. While, while Alyssa's setting that up, um, 
Nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, my apologies for being late. I hope I, I didn't disrupt the flow here of the discussion. Uh, sounds interesting. And thanks again to our colleagues in Japan for uh, accommodating us here in uh, Europe and uh, the East Coast of North America. So appreciation for that. Nice to see some familiar faces and also to read some uh, not familiar names. So. Um, Again, as Alyssa said, my name is uh, Josh Bongard, and I've been working in the space uh, of evolutionary robotics for uh, going on 25 years now. Time time flies. Um, so assuming we can get the video running, uh, what you're going to see uh, in that video is a sort of a snapshot of some of the projects I've been involved in uh, over the years in evolving embodied systems. Um, pretty straightforward idea. Uh, evolutionary robotics has been around since the early uh, 1990s. Uh, we evolve the body and brain of embodied machines in simulation, cross our fingers, and then hope that we can somehow uh, create a physical version of that uh, in, in reality. Thank you, Alyssa. That, that looks good. Um, so uh, again, here's a series of snapshots of some of these projects. And I wanted to just uh, I'll let this video play on loop and sort of talk at some of the projects here and highlight, I think, why embodiment is so important and how it relates to, to creativity and possibly points to uh, some of the, the current limitations of, of AI. Um, so yeah, Alyssa, if, you can, if you're able to play that video there and then just put it on continuous loop, that would be great. Thank you. So over these 20 years of evolving bodies and brains of robots, I, I've sort of identified a number of uh, things that have changed over the years. Um, what you can see in the top row uh, of this uh, video here is our traditional machines, you know, things we're very familiar with, collections of metal and ceramics and plastics and sensors and motors and kinematic chains. Um, which ra raises a lot of interesting questions about embodied cognition, what's possible, what's what's not possible. Um, what you uh, might be able to see in the middle row, uh, sorry, the middle right panel and the lower left panel is some of our work on uh, soft robotics. And this is following in the footsteps of uh, Nick Cheney. I see Nick is here. Uh, Nick pioneered the sim to reel of soft robotics using soft bodied simulators. Um, We've been trying to follow along in, in his footsteps and, and sort of explore now that you can uh, task an AI with designing the structure and function of soft machines, what kinds of embodied cognition is possible in soft machines that isn't possible in rigid machines? There are a number of things. Shape change uh, is one of them. I'm not going to talk about uh, soft robotics too much uh, today. I know our time is limited. I wanted to focus a little bit more on what you can see in the bottom uh, middle uh, bottom middle panels there. This is our recent work with uh, Mike Levin's group at Tufts University on biological robotics. So there's been a shift in robotics from rigid robots to soft robots, and now this increasing merging with synthetic biology and the ability to create uh, biological robots or AI-designed organisms or xenobots. They have sort of a lot of different names at this point. This is particularly interesting because now you have an AI that is trying to build an embodied machine, which hopefully does something useful or exhibits some aspect of embodied cognition, but it's building those machines out of machines, out of cells, which are themselves arguably the most complex and, and competent machines that exist on the planet. So I think that's also opening up a whole new avenue to think about embodied intelligence, which is creating robots made of robots made of robots or machines made of machines made of machines. And that brings us back to this question of why are we bothering to study embodied cognition at all? How, does, how do robots differ from or how do they say anything about intelligence above and beyond what non-embodied state-of-the-art AI might be able to tell us like ChatGPT? The minute you think about building embodied machines, which are themselves composed from embodied machines, it suggests a lot of opportunities for being able to grapple with the real world differently from the way non-embodied machines uh, does so. One of the most interesting ways, I think, is the issue of surprise. You know, one of the hallmarks of intelligence is if you throw a surprising situation at an organism or a machine, if it's able to survive and continue thriving uh, in the face of that surprise, that's intelligence. If you have machines built from machines built from machines, you can imagine all of those subsystems being exposed to that surprise simultaneously. And if you have competency at many different levels of organization, 
it is unlikely that they're all going to be surprised simultaneously. Put differently, from a, from a biological point of view, there may be something that may be surprising to the entire organism, but the organs or the cells or the subcellular systems, from their perspective, from their sensory and motor uh, apparatus perspective, they are not surprised. It is something that is familiar. You take a monolithic machine, like a trained neural network, it only has one level of organization, and if it's surprised, you get all of the hilarious and potentially dangerous things we see with state-of-the-art chat GPT, autonomous uh, cars, and so on. So I think, you know, arguing that embodied, embodied intelligence and creativity is important, but the hard work, you know, still remains ahead of us, which is, the devil's in the details. What exactly is it about embodied intelligence that confers intelligence and safety simultaneously? I'll finish by just uh, pointing to the bottom right panel. Uh, it might be a little bit difficult to see what you're looking at there. What you're looking at is a metamaterial. Uh, a metamaterial is a, a human designed or an AI designed material that has surprising bulk properties. Um, a traditional uh, material, if you press from either end, it will bulge up and bulge down. You can design a meta material where it has surprising bulk properties. If you push from either end, it will actually bow inward rather than outward. That's just an example of a meta material. What you're looking at in the bottom right is our attempts to work, uh, our initial attempts with the uh, um, with Rebecca Kramer Botiglio's group uh, at Yale University and Corey O'Hearn's group also at Yale University to task an AI with designing meta materials and then transferring them for, uh, to reality. In that video in the bottom right, again, it's a little bit difficult to see here, but these individual small plastic pucks uh, are vibrating back and forth. The leftmost puck is actually being stimulated. We are actually uh, vibrating that leftmost puck and vibrations are propagating through the material. Uh, my PhD student, Atusa Parsa, is designing, uh, is having an AI design these metamaterials to compute. So you can actually create a computer where information is encoded as vibrations. Um, one of the interesting things she's found about that is you can design a computer uh, to compute various functions using vibration. Um, she's been able to create very simple logical gates and or and not. And one of the very surprising things she found just by accident is that in some cases you can point to an individual particle inside that material and you can, you can pull out of that individual uh, particle vibrations at different frequencies. And those vibrations at different frequencies turn out to be co uh, computa different computations. So you can get basically a computer or a computational device that is computing multiple logical functions in the same place at the same time without recourse to quantum effects. That was a very surprising result uh, to us and our, our colleagues. Pulling back from that, that, that discovery suggests to us that again, there are things that physical materials can do that traditional computers and all the code that we write for traditional computers simply can't do. So another argument in favor of embodiment, and I think in the spirit of creativity, is there are things that physical objects can do or physical phenomenon that can be exploited and recruited for the service of computation and ultimately intelligent action and behavior that we don't even know about yet. There are many, many uh, unknown unknowns out there probably residing in, bra uh, in biological brains, in biological bodies as well. And our unrelenting focus on neural, uh, neural tissue and neural networks is, is ultimately flawed. We're looking for the keys under the, the lamppost. There are many other phenomena out there that we have no idea about. We refer to it as sort of the, the dark matter of cognition. It would be surprising if there wasn't if there weren't things out there to be discovered that support intelligent action and behavior. And I think I will end there. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I think uh, all of us, as uh, the, greater, the greater AI and robotics community, we need to look more broadly at how mother nature has creatively created intelligent machines and try and build that into our machines. Thanks very much. And apologies about the uh, video.
And no worries about the video. That was super cool and really exciting. Uh, loved all the little videos. They were super fun. Oh yeah, and, and Tim has his hand raised, which is perfect because I was just about to say, um, with your last point, Josh, um, I read in a paper by Tim's uh, that, uh, um, what, what is it that, uh, um, one of the things that computational simulations can't do and what makes them different than physical systems is the number of modes that they interact in. So, so uh, uh, Tim, I'll uh, I'll let you go ahead and and, and say things. <laughs> uh, hi, Josh. Sorry, I just it, I accidentally pressed the button. <laughs> I didn't, oh. didn't mean to raise my hand, but um, yeah, that was a, a really nice talk and that uh, the stuff about evolving or experimenting with new materials is is very cool. I uh, I look forward to reading more about that. Thank you. Well, it, just uh, about that point, uh, again, I take your point, obviously, about the limitations of simulation and, and specifically about not being able to simulate multiple modes. One of the things I've learned slowly over the years of doing sim to real is the most interesting work ha happens when sim to real fails. When sim to real fails, it in a way, that's you know the real world telling us that there's something that's missing from our simulation. And again, often what's missing is an unknown unknown. And that's particularly true with the xenobots. There's gazillions of biological processes that we're not simulating. I think one of the things that's interesting for the future is how do we re-architect some of these sim to real and real to sim you know, pipelines so that the AI is not just trying to create intelligent machines, but trying to create machines that point us towards the unknown unknowns, that, that guide us towards discovery of phenomenon that are supporting intelligent action that we can then build into our simulations and, and carry on. Oh yeah, Takashi, go for it. Hey, uh, hi, Josh. Hi, Takashi. <laughs> hi again. Uh, yeah, but well, this is a very uh, interesting uh, talk. And uh, my question is, uh, because we have a language, that we uh, we do understand those systems have such such a potential and creativity, right? But that's why we use you know language. The human is necessary to those system to be found as a creative uh, resources, right? So uh, the recent uh, you know uh, tons of papers using Open GPT, you know Chat GPT, other things, you know, uh, shows us that uh, the system. Uh, the, the GPT three or four plus planning and large memory is has a huge potential to uh, be creative, right? But for these hardwares, I I'm not sure. I mean, I uh, I, I agree with you. This uh, this is the the potential of embodiment is is super, and uh, there's dark matter in there, right? However, that should be coupled with. Uh, language system or some sort of a simple processing systems uh i you have to think about it because of this power of chat gpt what do you think of this i i, I agree I, I obviously don't think the future is going to be either or it's not one or the other it's how to bring these two systems together chat gpt mm -hmm. makes me nervous because of how unconstrained it is you know, and, and there's been a lot of arguments about connecting chat GPT to, you know, autonomous robots and therefore mm -hmm. sort of giving chat GPT eyes and arms and hands and so on. Yeah, yeah. But that's the exact opposite of how Mother Nature does things, right? We all start as individual cells and those cells can't do much. So, you know, biological development and growth and all the all the gradual processes that exist in nature, they, they self scaffold themselves. And you know, taking an extremely powerful large language model and attaching it to you know complex robots or you know fast-moving autonomous cars and drones, in my opinion, that's the most dangerous thing you can do. You're you're taking something that has a lot of computational degrees of freedom, mm -hmm. ChatGPT, and you're coupling it to something that has a lot of mechanical degrees of freedom. And as we already know from ChatGPT, it it makes an infinite number of mistakes just because it's unconstrained. And open AI is playing whack a mole, trying mm -hmm. to, you know, yeah, but, but, yeah. no, no, I agree, I agree. But just uh, the usually that we, we say that um, 
you know, the infinite, you know, the unconstrained nature of language or GPT-3 and 4 is rather constrained by the physical constraints. So coupling with the autonomous robot, then GPT-3 becomes more, you know, reasonable. So that, I, th I think that's something that we have to do. Then we can make, you know, more powerful and then also quite, uh, you know, re re reasonable, you know, behavior would be, you know, uh, creating. I, I agree. The million, the million dollar, possibly the billion dollar question is, you know, which machines, which embodied machines do you attach it to? Right, right. How that's complex right, right. do they be? And all, you know, all of that. Yes, but I yeah, agree. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the future is combining these systems. Yeah. Hmm. So we are in a very critical period, right? I mean, we're agreed. exploring, you know, hardware. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. agreed. Yeah, I wanted to read some of the comments from the chat. Um, so uh, Shingwei says that uh, there's a really cool point about physical materials. Mul physical materials is multiplicity. Um, also talking about the macro effective uh, spin in H2O near cell membranes versus uh, bulk water. Um, and uh, he also mentions that Sid, Sid Nagel at University of Chicago uh, studies energy physics materials research and particularly studying physical phenomenon like how water drops splash under the vacuum for which there's no physical theoretical account yet and their lab motto is their <laughs> motto, motto the lab motto is where theory comes to die which is a pretty cool I love it I love it <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, you know, there's a cool, there's cool theories out there that, um, you know, cilia, these tiny hairs on the surfaces of cells, you know, they agitate the fluid and they create complex flows. Th that's a storage medium. If you want to store huge amounts of information, complex information, agitate water. It's a fantastic, you know, and you've got every cell doing that simultaneously all the time. So if you want to compute the memory storage, you know, of an organism and you're looking in the brain, you're looking in the wrong place. You know, it's it's just amazing what's possible. And so it's a great example. You know, there, there are these unknown unknowns that people haven't even they haven't even viewed it from a computational lens yet, let alone try to you know recruit it for robotics and AI. It's. There's so much out there. Yeah, great, great points. Thank you. No, Olaf recommends uh, chatting with uh, uh, Richard Richard Watson. Recent work has been interesting. <laughs> thank, thank you, Olaf. Yeah, Richard, Richard, Mike, and I are already talking about some of these things. But but thanks for the thanks for uh, mentioning Richard. Sounds great. All right. Um, do we want to? So I guess we will we'll continue this discussion in in the open discussion part. Um, and do we want to take a break now, or do we want to have one more speaker? It's totally up to it's totally up to all of us. What do you think? Vote for break now. <laughs> Raise your hand and uh, don't vote at all for break later afterwards. One for the break now. All right. Well, I think <laughs> I think I think the majority is we'll do one we'll do one more speaker. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Let's see here. All right. So let's go to Nick Cheney. How does that sound? That sounds great. I've uh, switched computers and the webcam seems to be working now. So fingers crossed the screen share does the same. Okay, great. Well, let me inter let me introduce Nick Cheney to everybody uh, who's joining us. So he's an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Vermont. He directs the UVM Neurobotics Lab, an interdisciplinary group of thinkers and doers who draw inspiration from biological systems to design machine learning algorithms for artificial neural networks. All right, and so I'm super excited. Let's let's hear it. Great, thank, thanks so much. Uh, you can hear me and see my screen? Yep, looks great. Perfect. All right, we've uh, outmatched the technology problems here. So uh, yeah, uh, really great to be here. Um, my talk today is, is uh, 
kind of tongue-in-cheek called constraints enable creativity, how viability can lead to evolvability. So uh, I was really excited by by this prompt and, and by the speakers here and, and by this uh, lightning talk format. Unfortunately, I can't go into depth on all the things I want to, so I'm just going to tease about five talks I would give if I had time. And maybe in the discussion, we can go into detail on, on any of those. Uh, given the prompt of the creativity of embodiment, uh, most people would think that I would talk here about all of the, the super cool embodied robotic design we've been doing. But luckily, Tim and Josh have both uh, advertised some of that work for me already. Um, the maybe simplest version of that is totally embodied uh, intelligence where we have no control. Uh, try and build off of the ideas of like passive walkers where we just take structure to try and create uh, complex movement. Here we're gluing together a bunch of jello cubes and the only control is that two of them oscillate out of phase. Um, and we throw this at, a, at an evolutionary algorithm that we ask to just create robots that move as quickly as possible. Um, the, uh, you probably can't see the well through the video call here, um, but the smoothness and, and lifelikeness and diversity of form and function here, I think, uh, beautifully demonstrates the creativity of evolutionary systems um, in this sort of embodied context. And I think that uh, a beautiful demonstration of this work is, is uh, out of Ken Stanley's lab, the pick reader work, looking at using the same sort of encodings for generative art. Um, this is the first talk that I'm not going to give today. Um, if you want to hear it, there are lots of versions online, including one kind of especially aimed towards creativity. Um, you can look them on, on YouTube later. The question I'm going to ask isn't kind of what are the things we can do with this system, but why does it even work at all? This is something that uh, I've kind of been stumped by for a long time. The idea of throwing a big complex problem like this at evolution and asking for random mutations to give you complex structure when with any complex system there are so many more things that can break uh, whenever you're making some sort of change whenever you're trying to make progress especially when the progress you're trying to make are big creative jumps and in, in large innovations that necessitates so much coordinated change to, to kind of make any meaningful output and, and move the needle here why does this ever work at all um, and I just showed an example of when it was working, but as we start to make that system more complex, so for example, rather than going from the passive walker that just used embodiment, we tried to throw neural network controllers on top of this and took the same exact system, uh, threw it at the supercomputer, came back the next day, and absolutely nothing happened. Uh, instantly converged to some premature optima uh, within this landscape, you see fitness flatlines immediately. All the different colors here are different morphologies, different body plans of the robots. And you see there's almost no innovation here happening in new structures, uh, new body plans for these robots. Uh, talk number two I'm not going to give is, uh, is our approach to thinking about using embodiment and our uh, understanding of brain body systems and how they're fragilely co-adapted. Um, to enable more morphological innovations in an algorithm we call morphological innovation protection, uh, which reduces selection pressure on some robots that are evolving and, and newly uh, mutated um, to enable this continued innovation and exploration. And you can see we make uh, continued progress, but more importantly, uh, are able to explore over many, many more body plans. The takeaway from this uh, for me is that this space of evolving embodied machines is a super rugged, very multimodal landscape that's really, really hard to optimize on. So the, the question here is, how do we enable evolvability? And I'm going to connect that in, in this talk to robustness. Now, I'm by far uh, not the first person to, to draw connections between these two ideas. Um, and Andreas Wagner has a really nice paper talking about the um, the antagonistic nature of robustness asking for small mutations while evolvability wanting to make these big jumps. I think another interesting perspective here is even how those things come about, that evolvability is a long-term 
uh, goal many generations down the road where, um, where we need to think about what sort of short-term immediate selection pressures can lead to something like that. Um, this paper from, from Jeff Kloon is beautiful and talks about how modularity could be a, a proxy for that and even how just wiring costs within the brain can lead to modularity and then evolvability down the road. Um, I think an another interesting perspective on, on Wagner's paper here um, is the how he thinks about the uh, robustness creating evolvability. He talks a lot about neutral mutations um, and and plateaus within a, a fitness landscape where we have lots of points in here in green that are approximately the same quality um, and suggests that if you have a space where there are many, many neutral mutations, which he uh, demonstrates is true in, in some biological systems. You can take that, uh, that neutral mutation network and with a big enough population uh, spread out to reach almost any interesting uh, or fit local optima you would want to, or, or uh, not even local, but, glo but optima you would want to reach within this space. I think this maybe makes sense for kind of the perturbed equilibrium of biological evolution, but when we're trying to apply this to engineering, I think it's it's much harder to think about having a big enough population or enough time uh, or enough neutral mutation uh, without any direction to actually make this thing uh, successful. And this kind of uh, really excites me, but also worries me in the, in the way that uh, I think it relies on a, a constrained search space, maybe the way that novelty search might have, uh, where it works really beautifully um, within a, a very limited scope. But if you start to look at truly open-ended problems, you need kind of more uh, quality diversity approaches that look at kind of both the, the novelty and, and uh, fitness of, of these solutions. Um, Talk number three I'm not going to give uh, is that I think that there's really interesting connections, though, with the idea of neutral mutations um, and, and deep learning. Uh, one of my favorite uh, ideas in deep learning right now is the lottery ticket hypothesis, suggesting that there's lots of effective subnetworks within any one deep neural network. Um, and I could uh, yeah, give a, an hour-long talk just on that idea uh, alone. But to, to come back to the, the core thesis here, I think the interesting thing that, that I want to uh, emphasize um, about Wagner's work uh, and, and idea here is the idea of um, genotype to phenotype mappings being a many to one mapping. That that's how we get uh, these neutral uh, mutations and these uh, plateaus in the landscape. Um, and especially connecting it to, uh, to Waddington's uh, epigenetic landscape, the idea that if we think about development as, as some process that starts from many genotypes and funnels the, those genotypes down into specific phenotypes, again, a very embodied idea here, um, that we can take two different starting points and lead them to the same, uh, the same morphology, the same robot, the same agent. Um, and in particular, I want to emphasize here that that could be from a mutation um, happening within some evolutionary process. And the trick here is to be able to make sure that we're funneling, we're designing that landscape, that developmental process in a way that funnels us towards highly fit or at least viable um, solutions uh, in our phenotypic space. So uh, this seems like something that actually does have a very immediate short-term selection pressure that uh, like begets like, uh, we're trying to uh, produce offspring that are like us, cats make kittens, dog make, dogs makes, makes puppies. Um, and we have to do this in the face of a bunch of mutations that should be breaking the system all the time. And just the evolutionary pressure to be robust to these mutations, I think, is exactly the sort of thing that, that uh, forces our epigenetic landscape to try and funnel us towards highly viable solutions where you don't break everything. You end up in a similar sort of phenotype or at least a viable phenotype. Um, that's robust, robust against these random variations. Um, I wanted to tie into some cross labs work that I, I wrote this paper uh, a while ago with Lisa Soros, um, thinking about the viability um, and how similar uh, a child needed to be to its parent uh, in, in Lisa's beautiful chromaria framework. And 
showed that that actually this idea of viability uh, very much impacts how we think about open-ended evolution and having a criteria that's too strict that a parent has to be exactly like its child um, doesn't lead to anything interesting. Having anything survive leads to just random noise, but some middle ground between that is, is kind of the edge of chaos, the critical point here where we get interesting innovations happening over time. Um, the uh, the other thing, the other framework I want to pitch for this is that there's uh, I think a really nice analogy to current machine learning systems for uh, for this like begets like um, robustness enables uh, evolvability um, within the idea of autoencoders here. So if we think about the, the kind of phenotype to genotype to phenotype mapping being like going from a high dimensional input into a compressed latent representation and back. We can think of being robust to noise, like uh, denoising autoencoder as being our robust uh, version of this, and being able to walk around and explore and find new variations uh, like a variational autoencoder uh, being the evolvability part. And I want to argue that uh, within, this, uh, within this analogy, the decoder that enables us to find these highly fit phenotypes that lets us decode into viable solutions um, is, uh, is exactly the underside, the, the side of Waddington's landscape that we don't often look at, which is the, the gene regulatory network underneath, which is shaping this landscape. Um, and, and I think that uh, running with this analogy, we can, we can shape this landscape into something uh, that enables us to make really big jumps in this space um, and still lead to viable solutions, even though just combinatorically, if we were to make a random mutation uh, directly in the phenotype space, it should never, ever work. Uh, this idea I wanted to show a citation for, we uh, are still working on it. This is ongoing work with, with Kevin Mitchell, um, who's a, a faculty in genetics and neuroscience at uh, Trinity College Dublin. And we're still a week or two away from having our, uh, our manuscript done on this. Uh, so if you want to hear more about it, uh, email me and I'll send you the preprint as soon as it's public here. I see I'm already a minute or two over, so I'm going to skip over the work talking about how uh, we have a, a gecko paper this year thinking about uh, looking at robustness to increasing size morphology changes and how different scenarios can uh, change the impact of those mutations. Uh, I'll also skip over some work with, uh, with Josh Bongard um, that I think Tim actually showed a, an image of uh, talking about how we can reduce the impact of mutations from an embodied perspective by thinking about the interactions of this system with the environment over time um, that allows us to explore things near the end of its lifetime like falling down that enable us to find huge uh, innovative creative solutions like rolling in the space. Um, and I'll just say that my, the last thing I'm not going to talk about is uh, that we're going to, we just got funded to continue this work for the next five years, thinking about how uh, we can frame an embodied intelligence perspective on neuroevolution and on architecture search for deep learning with Josh and Kevin and also Jeff Kloon and, and Risa McElaine and two of the other people I, I really love to talk about um, work in this space with. And uh, super excited to be here to talk with, with you folks at, at Cross Labs because I think there's, uh, again, a lot of areas of overlap and really excited for, for conversations and hopefully collaborations to come out of this too. Uh, Thanks a bunch, and uh, feel free for anyone watching uh, on YouTube later to reach out uh, via email here um, to chat about these ideas later, too. Thank you. Super great, and big congratulations on the award. Yay, that's so Thank great. You. <laughs> and, and also, I really love these videos of these, these like, cube jello guys just going across the screen. They always make me smile. Thanks for sharing them. <laughs> um, so I wanted to read a comment that Shinwei had in the chat. He said that the judgment of fitness is a trait in the eye of the beholder. More a more new neutral attitude is by S.J. Gould, Marcelo uh, Buiati, Giuseppe Longo in randomness and multi-level interactions in biology. Uh, and you, the page, pages 22 to 23, you can see it in the chat. Uh, punctuated equilibria of Gould and Eldridge within this frame can be explained as the effect of the disruption of more or less uh, steady anti-entropy anti cons uh, con constitutive dynamics due to the uh, bioresonance leading to a short but extended critical time interval 
of increased variability at the end of which new organization of the system. So diffusion of life uh, entails increasing complexity just because of the original symmetry breaking due to the formation of the first living entity, which is considered by principle of least complexity, an arbitrary but sound axiomatic choice. Gold, call, uh, Gold calls this asymmetry the left wall of life, or its origin, whatever this may have been. So this account does not need a selection mechanism characteristic of some evolutionary accounts. Yeah, I absolutely could not agree more. Um, I just use selection in this framing, given the A-Life community here. Uh, talking to biologists, don't you dare say anything about uh, selection based off of fitness for traits um, or or you'll never hear about anything else for the rest of the q a um, the the idea of punctuation punctuated equilibrium is an idea we could have again maybe that's talk number six i didn't have time for here and, and if you were to talk to lisa or, or ken or jeff about these um, they would talk about the, the feedback about how the agent changes the environment and changes the other agents and the feedback loops there. But I think, yeah, even thinking about uh, more in the scope of, of this talk here, how mutations occur, that, that the, the, um, the symmetry breaking and how we create more adjacent possible with each mutation, opening up more innovations and more opportunities for creative steps forward. Um, yeah, it's a super, super critical part of this that, uh, that we could definitely talk about more for a long time. Nice. And I'll also share a comment from Olaf in the chat. Um, so he says, uh, thanks, Nick. I like hearing a lot. Uh, I, I like a lot hearing evolvability added to the mix here. Creating uh, creativity as we tackle it in this workshop may relate to search. And as we had talked about it on the other days, what we heard from the previous talks was also hinting at coordination beyond genotype slash phenotype mapping into what he sees as a meta search algorithm, which extends to uh, DL2. What? Deep learning. Deep learning. Yes, deep learning. Um, and, and he's also sharing a paper, uh, with, uh, so the link is in the chat. So it's a paper from a couple of years back that was exploring these ideas. He says that he thinks that a larger framing of neutral spaces are a productive way of looking at creativity in generative systems. Yeah, absolutely agreed. And, and thanks for the paper, Olaf. I'll, I'll have to give it a, a read. I haven't come across that one before, but um, just uh, scanning the title and abstract here is kind of exactly the way I would have responded to uh, to, to that question is that, um, yeah, certainly, uh, certainly this is some sort of meta objective uh, over time. Um, and, and there's, I think, really nice analogies to the multi time scale evolutionary processes that I just uh, kind of very briefly uh, flashed up from from Josh and I's work. Um, but I, I I'm really interested in the analogy, uh, like you mentioned, between uh, these multi-time scale interactions on the evolutionary side of things, which is actually a lot of what the the my work in soft robots and embodiment is is based off of thinking about um, how these different time scales interact, and and the analogies in deep learning of thinking about current uh, meta learning approaches um, and and objectives at, at different scales of temporal resolution, but also spatial resolution, even just within the layers of a network. Um, again, kind of going back to the autoencoder idea of thinking of subsequent layers within a network, like unfolding of some physical process um, with, with kind of feedback loops and, and tight interactions. And, and that's actually kind of the collective intelligence uh, analogy I, I wanted to make to, to some of the work going on here. Um, and, and yeah, there's lots and lots of, of directions to explore that analogy. And, and that's a place my group is really interested in, in digging deeper and trying to uh, explore that more at a, at a, in an implementation level to, uh, to think about uh, um, how those analogies hold up and especially how they break down too. Nice. So we have time for uh, one more comment or question, and then we will take a break and then hear from Takashi and have an open discussion. Uh, 
Oh yeah, Shingren, yes. Hi, I was typing, but I can't type fast enough to <laughs> just say it. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. Um, you know, in light of what Josh was talking about with the uh, examples from physics or material systems, there's a big difference, right, between doing search, let's say, in a computer, a present-day computer system, and um, and whatever happens in the physical space in the following way. The physical machine is a finite is a finite space, and the operators are given in advance, that is, the, the way the OS works, the, op, the choice of programming language, the basic primitives, primitives of the language, and so forth, so on. Okay, those are all given in advance. And we've seen from the examples that Josh was pointing out to that we can't assume that, that we, we just don't even know what the operations are in the physical system. We can't predict what the operations are, operators are in the physical system. You can retrospectively, you know, after some experimentation, decide, ah, these are the ones we pay attention to, for example. Now, given that, that means the search, there's not a search space, there's not a given space within a search can happen when looking at a material system or even less a met metabolic system uh feeling its way forward as it as it evolves right so 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 it might be a really big problem to actually even define what search means and what kind of space where the space is not given in advance we need another notion right i think to account for this yeah absolutely and and uh Kind of as I implied, but maybe didn't say out loud in the the connection with biological evolution, search is a, a hand wavy metaphor here, and and maybe not exactly the right uh, the right uh, framing for thinking about evolutionary systems. I do think that your your point about the complexity and pre existing constraints, I would even say, kind of pre existing building blocks to work with in physical systems is really interesting and another area of, of my lab that i didn't have time to talk about maybe is is thing number seven we could have dove into an hour-long conversation on is is uh thinking of uh the analogies between like physical reservoir systems and, and neural reservoir computing where we're just using a bunch of pre-existing basis functions um, of transformations of complexities that are inherent in some physical system or in some you know randomly wired wired neural network for example and asking about uh, how we can most effectively and especially most efficiently take advantage of what's out there already without having to learn all those things from scratch in a way that's not possible or just not uh, economical um, in in traditional search Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. All right. So we'll pause the discussion and let's go ahead and take about a 10 minute break. Um, because I want to make sure we have plenty of room for open discussion afterwards. We have so many amazing comments and we have so many great things to get back to. So, um, yeah, so let's come back at, uh, whatever hour it is for you at 40 minutes. So 10, 10 30, come back at 10 40. Right. See you soon.
All right, I think we're ready. Is everybody back? I still is nine minutes, probably. <laughs> yeah, Jesse's here. All right, awesome. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to continue and uh, we're going to have Takashi say some very exciting words. So let me go ahead and pull up my notes here. All right, so yes, so Takashi is joining us. Um, and uh, so he's been working on the field of artificial life for more than 20 years. He is researching the evolution of genetic codes, mutation rates, and cooperative relationships. So for example, uh, he's looking at the complexity of coupled cognitive systems. And recently he's interested in constructing artificial life in the real world. All right, so um, absolutely, like we're uh, there's no reason to to have a, a presentation or anything like that. But um, if if you'd like to say a few words, make a few points, um, uh, we're, we're excited to hear from you. Take yeah. it. Can, can I uh, can I upload some some of my slides? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Let me make sure you have permissions here. Yeah, 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 yeah you should have permissions here. Mm -hmm. So do I have to click uh what the you enter screen? That's the what I have. I'm not familiar yes. with this. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, right. So so there's a uh, there's an icon next to the happy face. It's a square with an arrow pointing upwards. Um, at the bottom of the screen. At the bottom of the screen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Screen. Yes. Okay. Uh, then it says uh, you enter entire screen or a window. Uh, should I choose window? Yeah, choose. Yeah, try choosing window. See if that works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You think you can see this or what? No. Oh, that's, yeah. oh it's loading. It's loading. Oh, yep. Yeah, we can see. Uh, yes. It's not in presentation mode though, so you'll have to just click the the icons on the side okay, okay, and then okay. go down. That way. Yeah. So can you see it? Oh yeah, here we go. Perfect. All good. Right, Thanks. right. So when I present this, then I cannot see my face or the attendance faces. No. Oh. Maybe not. Oh, so sorry. Yeah, that's that's Google Meets is, is not. Yeah, that's why that. I don't like. Google. Okay, okay. Yeah. So let me uh, simply uh, introduce uh, why I'm into, interested in uh, creativity, right? So I. Uh, these three, four, five, three, four years, I made a um, Android robot, which is a um, um, very simple robot with a camera inside uh, eyes. Then try to mimic a uh, person or Android in front of him, right? And then so this, so this one is a mutual uh, imitation um, play. So the Android on the le left hand side is mimicking the behavior of, of the android on the right hand side and then also the same thing the android on the right hand side try to mimic the android on the left hand side so this one is how it because they are trying to mimic at the same time and their behavior is just sort of synchronizing. Right. But then we do the same thing for uh, Android versus a uh, human. Uh, human subject. So this one is my, my, he's my PhD student and he tries to uh, mimic Android's behavior and then also Android is, uh, is trying to mimic a uh, student's behavior.
Well, so it's uh, some people, you know, criticize because uh, human body is different from under the body, right? So maybe um, we should do the same thing with the same body, like Android, but we have to change the brain, you know, instead of a neural network inside the other. So uh, this, so this one is uh, two human subject is posing, uh, possessing uh, Android. Then uh, when you when you wear uh, Oculus Crest, then you can see the other Android through his Android's eyes. And when you see your hands, then you what you see is uh, Android's hands, right? So it's completely uh, possessing Android's then do the same thing like uh, imitating each other So I have to say that, you know, uh, we, we did several uh, exam uh, tests with the different subjects, but it's always uh, shows, uh, uh, we found that, that the behavior of the Android is more uh, interesting and, and rich against uh, human, comparing with the uh, with, uh, behavior against the program, the author to author. So the same, so when, uh, Android is playing against other Android. Their behavior is a bit, you know, poor, and then you know there is no a new vari variety of behavior emerges. But when Android is playing against human, their behavior becomes more rich. So this is the projection onto the UMAP to this to this space. Then this one shows more diversified, and then you know, uh, but. Um, against program data it's not and then this one is uh, uh again a uh, possession that i said you know a human is possessing android and then this one is just a just a program the android again you know um, when you when the author is mimicking against a uh, possessed author his behavior becomes more rich so um one of the reasons why this one happened is because maybe humans' behavior has some uh, different type of fluctuation that uh, control the order has. So that becomes a source of creativity. So machine itself doesn't show any uh, strong uh, creativity, but once the uh, order is trained by a human trainer, then Android order becomes more creative that's what uh, that's what I'm, I'm saying you know and then i was saying that mind are con so my one of my messages that minds are contagious mind can be offloaded so once you mimic uh human behavior the android gets a human mind copied from him and then it copied from person to robot and then robot to robot and robot to robot so that it can be you know uh distributed to other members and eventually that they become the seeds of open and endedness and enabling enabling the machines that makes open and ended, open ended evolution that's kind of my uh, story um like you like you know um when the baby is born and then maybe the baby came out with come, come comes out without mind but once uh um the babies mimicking mother's face and behavior uh, after he, uh, like the, the early in the first three months or four months, that baby tries to mimic mother's face. And that then during that period, mind can be offloaded from mother to baby. That's a kind of hypothesis. And then there's an interesting um, um, 
there, there's an interesting uh, paper by Mike, Mike Tomasero that he says, do apes ape? That's the question. And then when he looked into uh, uh, this apes behavior, then the conclusion is the apes cannot um, imitate be, uh, other apes behavior or uh, humans behavior. When I try to pick up, uh, for example, like iPhone, then apes can pick up the iPhone like I did. But if I do some strange way that I pick up in this way or, you know, like this way, apes cannot mimic the behavior, but he can mimic, he, apes can understand my intention so that he can pick up the iPhone, but he doesn't uh, sensitive to the, to the side of motion that I did, right? But the human babies are very much, you know, sensitive to the, to the way that I pick up the iPhone. So if I pick up some strange ways, and the babies, you know, uh, primarily mimic the style, not the goal of the behavior. So that's the difference. So the Mike Tomaso says, apes cannot mimic the way that we, we mimic others' behavior. However, when the apes um, wrote about by uh, human beings, then apes are also, you know, becoming sensitive to, sensitive to the style of motion. And then he mimics not only the goal of the behavior, but also imitating the style of motion. So, so I'm saying that, you know, uh, human can be the source of creativity and you really have to have a big um, resources. Um, I mean, in order to have a creativity, I think human can be very helpful and uh, supportive. And then why the people are playing with um, chat GPT and thinks it's interesting is because they are using uh, huge corpuses from human um, language. And that's, that can be the, not, you know, the source for um, uh, creativity. And uh, I do know that um, uh, the paper from Stanford University that they they, are, they reported that uh, agents, you know, installed with uh, chat GPT, and they they spontaneously start to celebrate a Valentine's Day party. Uh, so uh, in in artificial life, that people try to understand why this uh, autonomy is emerging from from agents, and then. It seems like you know uh, the human language can be uh, you know a source for I mean a new type of spontaneity in the in in the ensemble of agents, which was very difficult to to get it you know without having such um, huge corpuses, GPT, and then also like that paper says. You know the pre uh, predictions and then also uh, uh, memories and memory retrieval is uh, is required. And in our paper that I didn't mention, but uh, this uh, Android is is try to um, it's complicated, but uh, this Android has uh, is try to mimic uh, the behavior. But uh, at the same time, he has um, he, he fails to mimic the behavior. Then he goes to um, he's storing all the behavior that he did um, for the last uh, ten minutes or something. And then he tried to uh, use those memorized patterns instead of directly imitating the behavior he what he sees through his eyes. Right. So this memory is very important. You know, in order to have a, a sort of creativity, I think. So uh, human is necessary to be there. And then also um, uh, big memory, so sorting his own memory, our uh, own behavior, and then try to retrieve the memory to play against the human. It's another uh, <clears throat> way to stimulating uh, uh, the other human's behavior then the richness of Android's behavior is increasing. So that's, I think, you know, in order to have a creativity in the machine, 
that we need a human, let the human to interact with Android. And then also he has to have a memory to storage and then he has to plan it. So these are the things that I think uh, the creativity is not just for free, but we have to, you know, uh, have a strategy to do that. And then that is you know, gradually, you know, emerging, I think. So, uh, I, so you know, in, you know, uh, like following what Josh says, as I said, you know, hardware, the rich and complex hardware is not good enough. I, I really like those, you know, uh, complex physical microstructures. However, we need some other things, uh, macro, you know, uh, memories and uh, memory retrievals, and then also some sort of uh, <clears throat> long-term prediction and short-term pre uh, planning might be necessary to couple with uh, embodiment. That's, you know, uh, sort of a thing that I'm thinking of for, for having creativity and then in order to install creativity in machine. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much for, for sharing. That's really exciting. Um, hey, do you, would you be okay with sharing some of the videos in the chat? Uh, because I think the, uh, the video was a little bit choppy and it would be really cool if we could see them and uh, watch them a little bit later. So uh, maybe okay, not yeah. like, yeah, maybe not like right at this moment, but oh yeah, not, you know, not at this moment. Okay, okay, then it's fine. Yes, I do. Okay, awesome! Yay, awesome! So, uh, yeah, uh, let's let's open it up to discussion. A lot of really good things in chat here too, uh, but I can I can read some things from chat. But if somebody wants to uh, unmute themselves in chat as well, then uh, go for it. Uh, so one of the things uh, that Olaf mentioned before is that he wanted to point out, let's see, uh, let me find it over here. Yeah, so what he likes here is the simultaneous exploitation of multiple modalities, which is often simplified to a mere unique channel with its unique noise distribution, capacity, dimensionality, dimensionality and et cetera. Um, and then also he, he had said uh, later that I think, um, so memory refers to your early work too, um, MTM, but for one of the last examples, it, it might require more structure as well. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you mean it's not just a memory, but uh, yeah, but Shai is over here, right? So maybe he can uh, explain more, you know, uh, if he can, uh, explain to me like, oh those are those are from olaf <laughs> oh it's from olaf okay so uh, yeah, yeah. can you repeat it again uh yeah so, uh, so yeah uh, you can speak right now yeah i see yeah yeah so um yeah she joined Yeah, his voice is dead. But do you, do you see his comment in the chat? Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, some chats. I cannot find this. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, this, that's right. So it's not just a uh, you know uh, memory from uh, from um, no one's view. It's from uh, his his own subjective view, right? So in order to use uh, use memory, this memory has to be stored, and that memory is taken from his subjective view. That's I think is a very important point, uh, especially for the for the Android to replay the behavior. But I uh, I didn't pay put so much stress on that. So I have to think about it. That's very interesting comments. So uh, thanks so much. And a follow up to that, uh, he says that reminds him of uh, uh, Vygotsky, who spoke of a private or internal speech, speaking yeah. to oneself out loud, 
as children they do and the fact that parents mm -hmm. may transmit knowledge through language may be using it as a catalyst for learning. So the channel mm -hmm. is more than a medium and part of the neutral space Nick mentioned earlier, like the uh, Waddington landscape, may include complex connective spaces like inviting this co-tensors, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a very interesting uh, yeah point. Uh, I'm I'm also a big fan of Vygotsky, and then you know uh, really want to make a connection between what Vygotsky want to say. You know the learnability of uh, you know from outside uh, uh, some some uh, some zone. That's what he said, right? Uh, when he uh, I forgot the that the terminology for that. But anyway, yeah. So uh, thank you for. Uh, yeah, pointing out that point. Yes, yes, I agree. So uh, that's exactly what I also wanted to understand. But uh, yeah, still, it's Android is not you know well, complex enough to do that. I'm afraid. Please, yeah, please, please. Hi, thank you so much Hi. for sharing the work. I, I'm glad to see you again, uh, Takashi. So. Um, thinking about the Vygotsky reference, but also going back to your examples themselves, I was wondering if we can take a different tack to receiving your work in terms of theater. <clears throat> After all, these are art art, art, art projects. Mm -hmm. So if we take a theatrical point of view, <clears throat> what's really interesting perhaps is that none of these are, you know, they're not meant to be scientific, it's an artistic response. Um, for example, we can think of the whole posing of the installation the way that the visitors come in are, or the performers are brought in is very much staged in, in, in different ways, right? So we could think, for example, of these um, androids as masks of some sort, right? A theatrical mask, because I'm thinking mm -hmm. of the great director, Jerzy Goltuski's work mm -hmm. with masks. In his case, of course, it's poor theater. He was training his human actors to even use their own skin, their tech, mm -hmm. and, and turning them into a mask through which they can perform. But the technology can be thought of as serving this kind of purpose of, of a mask, and we can go down that route. See, what do what do the different kinds of masks um, induce in the uh, uh, expectations of the performers and the audience? So, so that masking effect is very powerful. Can be it has great effects. I see. I see. Irrespective of the software, okay, irrespective of the algorithm, it's the masking of it. So, I'll put in links in the chat for later on of other artists like. Um, um, Demers and Bill Warren, who built this piece called Inferno, which is a very different intention, where people put on exoskeletons and they're sort of controlled mm -hmm. by scripts and they're forced, the bodies are forced to move in certain ways. So that's a different kind of encasing of the body of the performer, and they actually derive some pleasure in being, you know, cobotically controlled in such, mm -hmm. such a way, et cetera, et cetera. So, so maybe I, I'd like to hear from you, I mean, kind of the artistic intention, you know, what would you like to explore with this kind of inducement or constraints on subjectivity, you know? expectation uh, in the future yeah um th thank you for asking me that uh question um my first of my motivation was why that the uh, people needs um you know conductor for the orchestra you know because you can put uh, you know uh, like uh, metronome in front of the orchestra that may be uh, good enough for the people to play right but uh you know uh conductor is required to interpretation of the music itself, which is very difficult. And then whether I was, I wasn't quite sure whether the players can understand the interpretation by the conductor. And then does it reflect it on the way that people play the music? And that's what I wanted to understand. And also, I, of course it's difficult, right? But uh, when I, I used my Android to, to you know, play, with uh with orchestra i found that um we need a, a longer time to be with you know the players must be spend more time with android i mean as a conductor then they gradually you know uh, feel familiar to the android then you know first of all they didn't look up the android and they just play but the gradually they look up the android and they they you know um try to take a selfie with each other and then become a friend. Then there are some interesting, you know, resonance is coming out between Android playing behavior and then orchestra. That makes this, uh, you know, orchestra very successful, right? So uh, then after that, uh, several, you know, the musicians and uh, conductor came to me and then they really want to understand how this, uh, uh, you know, chaotic and crazy conductor 
certainly works for other music, not just this music, but for the other music, other types of uh, you know music. And then whether we need uh, more information about the players, like uh, can we take a, a heart, a, you know, heartbeat or the some you know temperature, or other you know uh, muscle tensions, you know, all these uh, muscle voltages, right? And then then send to the to send to the Android, and then Android you know uh, receives all this information from the players, and does it make this orchestra more unified and interesting? That was the project that uh, we are thinking. Uh, I mean, so that the, some of the you know uh, the real conductors are quite keen on doing that. So um, I've been discussing that with those people, and then, but I'm not quite sure. Well, how what kind of you know information is required for the for the robot mm -hmm. the conductor to interact with the orchestra players? And then, if we have more information from our players. Does the conductor become more uh, 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 powerful and then more uh, interactive? I'm not sure. You know, uh, mm -hmm. seems mm -hmm. like human conductors do not does not understand what the player's uh, internal state or emotional, you know, mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. They, mm -hmm. I think, it's more important is uh, how to how to interpret his own way the music that he is conducting, right? So maybe that's why I was thinking that maybe large language model is coupling with the Android is uh, another way to go. Maybe his uh, way to conducting gets much, much improved. And then he has a more, uh, you know, uh, intimate, becomes intimate with the uh, uh, you know, players. But mm -hmm. like Josh said, you know, uh, I, also it's quite dangerous to simply coupling LLM with, uh, you know, a complex robot. Um, I've never thought about it, but as just just said that I started to think about it. I I wasn't quite sure whether you know uh, this um, huge autonomous robot coupling with a large language model becomes dangerous, or uh, you know. So I don't know. But thank you, thank you for the for the question. I and mean, then that's what uh, the current sta stage mm -hmm. of this project. Is. Yeah. Just a final. Uh, tagged to what you're saying. There's a very rich work in the domain of music and technology, for example, IRCOM in Paris, or um, people in um, at Stanford, for example, or rather Berkeley CINMAT, which mm -hmm. have which have done a lot of work with musical instruments or electronic instruments, now working in wearable form. But I'll I'll I'll, I'll communicate with you yeah, offline. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Tim Otto Roth, I know you had a really cool uh, quote in the chat. Did you want to? Did you want to expand on uh, uh, expand on that? Um. Well. Um. Uh, yes, I quoted um, um, uh, Petrarca. Um, well, who discussed um, well um, the quality of imitation? So what I talked about on it on on Monday, um, and he just. Um, talked about well the different qualities um, um of imitation and and he said well the task for a poet is not simply just to reproduce because this is and this is what was triggered by takashi is that what apes do and this is what a poet exactly should not do so and he, he brings uh he exemplifies this a bit more i, I can post the, the 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 whole um citation if you want so in the chat so uh, and also the, the source, um, 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 uh, and also the Latin, uh, because I looked also for a, um, uh, the Latin, and it, it, he really says ape, so, and this is, um, uh, um, yeah, this is quite cool, so uh, you get the full thing, yeah. And um, yeah, and um, uh, in general, well, I love this idea of what uh, Joss brought in with with this, this and you also discussing it currently in the chat with with the failure. And um, it's interesting to think about because we had in Nick's uh, talk before this aspect of robustness. Mm -hmm. And um, if I recall, Kitano, um, who, who sp um, spoke about robustness, is that the worst case. Um, for robust systems are failures because they end up in a disaster. This is an interesting thought to think about um, how to combine these different um, ideas. 
So because, yeah, um, if you have a very robust airplane with all coded and that, that it flies sa safely, but there are some very, very, very rare occasions when the system can fa fail and, f and consequently the airplane will, will fall, uh, fall down uh, to the earth. So, so for instance, yeah. So, and I will pose the, the, the Petrarchar now um, to you. I just wanted to build on what Tim was Tim was mentioning, you know, the one of the things I think that uh, AI and robotics is doing is drawing us away from monolithic thinking, like thinking of the entire robot, the Android, the car, the organism, you know, we parts of us are failing all the time. And, <laughs> and you know, that, that's important. That's a part of, you know, how do you and again, this is something that Nick touched on, how do you reconcile robustness and failure and, you know, risk and opportunity? You know, we, we're making these physical machines, these embodied machines at least, in which failures, most failures are catastrophic because they are monolithic machines. They are not machines made of machines and machines. So it, it's binary. They either fail or they don't. And that's, you know, another aspect of, of unacceptable danger. One of the mm -hmm. things we can learn from, from nature is how she's able to balance failure and success, you know, simultaneously at all levels, at all times. These are things that really haven't been explored very much, I think, in in robotics and AI. And it's it's a creative solution. How do you fail and succeed simultaneously and and carry on? I see. I see. So I, think I also that... wanted. Oh, uh, I also wanted to note, actually, um, before we continue with this discussion, that our our last speaker did join us, and we're super excited. Um, so uh, I wanted to make sure that we had time so she had some thoughts to share about um, emotions in, in robots, which, which I think is, is really nice. So um, Nick, do you want to finish up with your, with your comment and then we can uh, hear from Fatima real quick? Would yep. that be all right? That, that's all right, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, sure. So, um, so Fatima, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, are you, are you, you're, you're still here, right? Yes, she is indeed. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Um, we don't hear you. Uh, do you have audio? She's muted. You're mm. muted. Maybe. Yeah. I see the mute sign. Yeah, you appear to be muted. Hi. Ah, hi. Yes. All right. Uh, so, do you want to give about? Oh yeah. Do Do you want to give about like a, a five minute introduction to the? Uh, uh, to your... Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome. So fast. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, just so for everybody, um, so Fatima, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're really excited. Uh, she got her PhD in effective computing um, from the University of Tartu with an emphasis on the study of multimodal emotional recognition. Um, she has past experience working on research projects with Kyoto University and is currently working on the NEBIO Institute's Smart Forest Project. So let's just hear from her real quick and um, yeah, and uh, let's have a discussion and uh, then we can continue with all the uh, points that we've been discussing. All right, go, go for it. Yeah, yeah, actually, I hope that you can see the, actually, my slides, yeah? Um, we see, I think you're presenting the wrong uh, a window. Uh, uh, Black like window. Just a moment, what happened, uh, because Oh. Is it correct? Uh, it looks like a white screen so far. But just a corner, uh, can we see? Uh, just, I don't know what happened. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. It's just... Uh, now should be here. Yeah. It should, yeah. Uh, let's see. It's no? loading. It's loading. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. 
that was my fault. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, actually, uh, today I want to talk uh, about uh, something that uh, I actually did uh, in my PhD. Uh, the study, uh, the study, uh, the ma major that I worked in was affective computing and multimodal emotion recognition. As you see in the picture, uh, in the end, we want to actually make able the machine or robots to try to understand what kind of feeling uh, we have. In most of the, actually uh, here, uh, affective computing is an uh, interdisciplinary field that is intersection between machine learning or maybe uh, deep learning or statistical learning. Uh, and also in another hand, uh, we are faced with the psychology um, uh, field of working and actually cognitive science. And um, we have uh, many things to do with the signal processing. Uh, so uh, if I want to um, actually say affective computing is the study of development of the tools uh, or maybe uh, for, for analyzing or maybe most of cases recognition of the human emotion or affect is something that come from the uh, some signals that come from the human. Uh, so uh, if if we actually see this chart, uh, we can see the the emotion recognition is an intersection between all those forces. Uh, and actually those parts that are related with the cognitive science, uh, machine learning and psychology, will we, we know it as affective computing, means affective computing is uh, actually, uh, uh, emotion recognition is a sub, uh, actually part of uh, affective computing. And that part that I just mentioned as a gray, it not, uh, uh, we cannot mention it as a affective computing and is something uh, that's uh, much more closer with the signal processing. Uh, the emotion recognition, if I want to talk with, in most of the cases, uh, they use the different models, uh, models that uh, they can be voice, images, bio signals, and the others. So means in most of cases uh, that now they are working is the combination between the voice and images and uh, but about the biosignals also, uh, researchers work a lot, but um, in less works, we can see the combination between the biosignals and voice and images. But in most of cases, when we are uh, focusing on the uh, emotion recognition, these two uh, will actually come together. And uh, we talk, we, we work with a speech, uh, if we, it's be uh, actually vocal based uh, signals like as a speech, or maybe if we work with the images, we can have a facial based uh, recognition system or maybe gesture. So uh, there's something that I did with the PhD. Most of cases I, I work with the speech based uh, emotion recognition. In case of that, that I really love it. Uh, the um, interesting part is how we can find those kind of features uh, if we don't use the deep uh, learning. Because if uh, we work with the deep learning, all the uh, most of the uh, actually effort goes to how we can develop this model to work on this kind of um, actually for 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 different application that we want to uh, develop. But uh, the interesting part for me. Uh, is how we can uh, actually design or maybe formulate new kind of um, features that uh, speech-based features that they come from the speech processing and also um, a little bit with the, um, something that we can find it in uh, culture uh, uh, science analysis all the, analyzing the culture uh, and also. Uh, this something else that uh, actually can be so interesting is the uh, study of uh, the denoising uh, issues that in this case uh, it's come and actually uh, it's my favorite in this case. Uh, so um, 
I just mentioned different, uh, actually, uh, databases, uh, sorry, different work that they use the different databases. Uh, the One of the most uh, famous one is Save that uh, they just use the for, uh, actually, f uh, male uh, native English speakers. Uh, and, uh, uh, but in other cases, uh, actually, just I worked with uh, fish, uh, I just uh, worked with the, um, not the multi mode, two modes that was uh, actually come from speech and uh, facial uh, expressions. In this case, um, I had a two strategy. Uh, one of them was extracting the manual features for facial expression and for a speech uh, signals. Uh, for the speech signal, actually, I just made that combination uh, that I think they can work for a different kind of databases. In this different kind of databases, we had just native speakers, uh, with the gender that they a um, male uh, speak uh, English speakers. Uh, another one was uh, the different kind of uh, English speakers with a different gender, uh, but they were not, not native. And another database that we used uh, was uh, uh, actually included uh, different kind of languages. They are native or non-native and different kind of access, accent because we wanted to know this kind of data that we are referring to it's uh, enough um, general so um, and with another strategy uh, we just uh, extract the, those kind of uh, effective uh, distances and angles in the face by using the uh, actually landmarks that I have it here uh, we just uh, actually put this landmark on the faces uh, of course, those key faces that uh, we wanted to use because when we actually have a video and we extract the frames, uh, most of those kind of uh, frames can uh, show you like as a neutral face and for all the emotions that you have, uh, they are um, uh, actually... Um, they are equal. So it means we have a different kind of frames for different, uh, we have the same frames for different kind of um, actually uh, different kind of emotions. So it means all of those same frames can uh, be uh, uh, actually recognized as a misclassified uh, images. So then in another way, we just use the uh, deep learning in that moment we use the CNN um, and uh, just like to know uh, and, and then we we, we just uh, made the output with the uh, actually confidences value and in the end we actually uh, as we see in this picture uh, we just uh, uh, made a fusion between this kind of different output that we received from the different strategy. And then finally, we made a classification. And I think this paper was, in that moment, was one of those kind of uh, successful uh, works that I had. And uh, uh, actually, in last uh, year of my PhD, uh, um, maybe um, around two years, I can say, uh, just I started with... Um, uh, thinking about uh, gesture-based emotion recognition. Uh, in that moment, uh, we had not that kind of uh, papers that they directly go through with the uh, gesture-based emotion. And in most of cases, we have for pose detection or something, uh, an object detection that they just uh, try to uh, detect the human. So just with a combination between uh, all those uh, and uh, those research, uh, we be able to make a survey that was a good uh, survey and in the end uh, just can help to uh, when we want to go with the gesture based, uh, which strategies maybe can help us and go through with and maybe which of this kind of strategy in the future, they, uh, they have a potential to uh, work, uh, we can work on them much more. Uh, so um, one of the good uh, ways that uh, in, that 
can be helpful is actually use the pose detections and skeletons in most of the cases in the gesture uh, case. And uh, actually, this, this kind of gesture-based emotion can be really using for different kind of application and useful application uh, that aren't really uh, much more interested to this one because in some cases, uh, this uh, emotional uh, gesture-based uh, recognition can be used for uh, some kind of disabilities that uh, maybe kids or maybe humans they have and solve some problems and those applications can be really useful. Um, in the end, uh, I can say if someone goes with, uh, actually goes through with the affective computing research area, uh, in the end of the day, uh, it will be familiar with machine learning techniques, deep learning, a statistical learning, modeling, a problem, simulation, data analysis, a speech processing, noise reduction, biosignal analysis, um, actually EEG signal analysis is something that the, the signal come from the brain and actually applied psychology. And it's a really interesting uh, field of study. Uh, and actually, thank you. Uh, arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you. That was really great. Uh, sorry, I'm just so fast. <laughs> so I made no, no. mistake in talking. <laughs> <laughs> you were great. You were great. No worries. That was, that was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if we have any questions uh, or comments, please please feel free to unmute yourself and, and say something. Um, I'm going to say something first uh, <laughs> since I'm already unmuted. Um, so I'm curious to know about how, uh, what are your thoughts about designing robots that are um, able to make their own meaningful gestures? Um, and I think, I think what is interesting there is um, humans, we make gestures that are important to us as humans, but if we look at other animals, they make gestures that we might not understand. Um, so it may be the case that robots uh, they might not have gestures that we would understand too. So do you think that robots, uh, depending on how we build them, would have completely different gestures and emotions even than what we would understand or experience as humans? Uh, uh, about the difference between the uh, maybe human and animals? Uh, more like, I was using animals as an example. Um, to think about how robots could be different than humans. Um, but if we were to design, like use this information to understand emotions and and expressions in robotics, what would that look like? Uh, yeah, actually uh, about the gesture, uh, the something that is there and uh, we focused on it and actually we try to, uh, is to, for, for actually I can say for, for have a, a gesture based, emotion recognition system we need to go through with two uh, actually two two part of the study one of them is a uh, modeling that how these models work good means uh, actually developing and implementing and raising up the accuracy of the model with in most of cases that is deep learning because we using uh, most of cases videos so the huge number of the data so the classical way doesn't work that much for this case so one way is that we are all the time have a facing a challenge with is that kind of deep learning part and another thing that i think is really important to know uh, which kind of for example actions can uh, in the end can define uh, what kind of feeling because in most of cases, uh, we can see the people, actually this kind of researchers, they just uh, focused on the, the structures of the deep learning and say, as a general work, how it's work. But in that case, for example, if we want to think that we are working uh, with the gesture of the, uh, actually kids with the uh, autistic, um, uh, actually disorders, and, or maybe autistic behaviors, it can be different 
with, the, for example, thinking about the students that they are on the Zoom, uh, they are just listening to the teachers and they are, for example, bored or maybe tired or something. So it means, um, first, we should know which kind of, uh, actually, because culture is important, Ge gesture, uh, actually gender is important in this case. Um, it means uh, when they are important, we should select those databases that those da databases can actually uh, fit our uh, deep models uh, correctly. So we cannot use the wrong data with the wrong strategy in the mind, to, but, but uh, just in the end, uh, expected that we have that kind of accuracy or maybe this deep learning works good for us. Maybe, for example, that deep learning can uh, understand and actually can, um, yeah, because YOLO now is in YOLO, is in a version of eight, is released. So it means it can work good, but we use the enough data and actually correct data for that. So I think uh, the, uh, we should be care about that one and robot also if we just feed it with the good data with the actually philosophy behind of that one be correct it's work good so uh, and technically if i want to explain uh, should i explain about technically oh it's uh yeah actually about the technically uh if we use that, we have a different strategy. If we use the Kinect cameras, uh, we have a depth, uh, actually vectors. So these depth vectors, we, we can have a skeleton of this kind of gesture. Uh, in the end, when we have enough data, uh, for example, and diff, uh, enough data with the enough labels, if we want to use a supervised learning, it means when we are bored for Persian is different with the Japanese. So if we want work on the general, maybe we need to have a much more data that can cover both. Persian, uh, actually a style of attire because uh, in, in some uh, points we are safe because actually the philosophy behind of this one is uh, gesture and facial expression, uh, it's uh, actually don't need to language. So it means Persian and Japanese are different in the language. But actually we should be care that they are different in the culture. This culture effect on that one. Culture effect on the actually, or maybe gender effect on the culture, culture effect on the gender. So the different genders, they show different kind of uh, movement. So those uh, skeletons, uh, just uh, deep learning, find those features, enough, uh, I don't know, features, and then um, uh, try to say the best. But we should be care about that a little bit of study now uh, we should have about the, uh, uh, actually the, the, the case of a study who are in, you know. So I think that one is uh, much more important than the, the... Yeah, thanks. That, that, that's a great answer. I appreciate that. Um, let's go to let's go to Solo and then we'll open up for uh, general discussion. Yeah, I was wondering, um, have you done any work on irony? Because sometimes humans will um, say something when in a specific context, you know they actually are feeling the opposite emotion. And since you mentioned multimodal, I was thinking maybe with a multimodal uh, analysis that takes in, into account the context of the, the speech, maybe it, it would... Um, do better in understanding um, opposite emotions uh, in relation to what is being said. It has um, irony. Have you done 
any or, or seen any research? Uh, actually, just uh, I, uh, I just um, I don't think so. I have that. I have not that experience myself uh to to work on the irony one but actually uh i just can say when i uh, was in japan um and when we worked on the for example uh, anger recognition in one of the cases i think for, because we have a as you know six basic uh, emotions when we are working on the basic one uh, maybe this answer can help uh we found in the case of the, for example, Japanese uh, uh, speech, uh, actually, when we work with the Japanese uh, language uh, uh, speakers uh, and on the speech, we could see disgust and anger. Both of them can work the same. Of course, in most of the cases that we have worked, because uh, in one of the work that I had, I found a table that this table tell us which kind of these basic emotions they are close to each other and they make, a, uh, when we work with them, we have a misclassification. And it's uh, obvious according to the output of this speech when we use a different kind of uh, uh, speech uh, features like as filter back energies when we put them we have the same so this is it's it's obvious when we for example uh, sometime we don't know someone shows disgust or maybe anger or maybe the root of both of them is the same so sometimes we cannot say both of them are a basic because basic cannot uh, actually uh, divided to to a smaller thing, you know. So maybe anger and disgust, both of them should be in the same page. So, uh, yeah, and for example, in case of the, for example, Japanese, uh, uh, because in some kind of cultures, for example, like as, uh, my culture or maybe in uh, Japan, people don't show uh, a lot their feeling culturally so uh, maybe Estonian I remember uh, I had a experience to work with the Estonian and uh, that was uh, really amazing and just uh, I, I remember that we, we trained this model uh, with the different kind of languages, uh, with the Indo-European languages, with the oral languages because Estonian also is oral now, uh, and finally, when we asked the students come and actually in the closed room, uh, show their feeling to some of those questions that uh, someone asked them, uh, was really funny because all the emotions was the same and all of them was like as neutral. So, <laughs> you know, maybe in that case, uh, uh, it's difficult. And actually, I think in that moment, just a speech or maybe just facial expression cannot work in that case maybe for example we can use if we are care and we need to know which kind of emotion it has we should add more modality like us for example have an eeg signals or maybe um, design a condition that uh, that we can receive the different kind of modalities and just uh, work. I hope that could answer your question. Um, just this was my idea. I don't know because I did not work on it. Yeah, I, I think that's a step. Uh, but I think that's something about meaning that it's in the context and simply yeah. by the signals, uh, we will still be missing something that take acting for example you, you can act any emotion and act any emotion you are not actually feeling so if you are in the middle of a conversation um yeah of course someone about how yeah. someone else felt yeah it means uh this is come from the fakeness how much they fake it yeah, because when we actually act 
uh, when when some of the people they use the make the databases, they use the professional actor. This is one of the lacks that databases have, because in the end, the something that we have as a data is a acted, you know, is a acted data in, in in classical databases that we have. But when it's go forward and forward, and uh, of course, because you know we have some kind of problem with the uh, ethics, actually ethics, that, uh, for example, we cannot uh, like a hidden camera just uh, prank the people to see how much they are afraid, you know. So we cannot do that kind of databases. If we want actually uh, aware them that we want to prank uh, prank you again is the same. So it means he knows and uh, actually um, this kind of reflection and this kind of actions that he shows is uh, not uh, exactly something that he showed okay yeah i actually i think this is related to some of the stuff that was uh being chatted about earlier about um having multiple modes of communication and um also it's a lot of it can be a result of the interactions and the dynamics so um i think this is a really great foyer into the conversations that's been uh happening in the chat and there's so much richness here um i i would just really love to see that if people want to uh who are in this chat on the side if you just want to go ahead and unmute yourselves and um share some of the highlights and and chat about it. I think that would be that would be fantastic. Uh, so we had Martin, Olaf, uh, Josh, and Nick, and and Tim, and and everybody. So please please go ahead and 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 share some of this exciting stuff that you've all been you've all been chatting about here. Okay, maybe I can start. I think I already asked this question a while before. So so the the I thought because. Because Josh, Josh actually uh, wrote the book on embodiment, or one of the books on embodiment, and there's and there's no GPT. I thought I should I should ask him about uh, whether his opinions have kind of changed. So I think in one respect, I think uh, like embodiment has these two aspects I mentioned there. That one, I don't know. I don't even know if these are like the official claims of embodiment, but this is how I understood it. It's like one of them is that uh, if you have some the right kind of embodiment, then basically you can reduce your computational effort to solve tasks. So for example, we have a kind of soft hand and that makes it much easier to grasp a glass than if we had like a steel hand like many robots do. So I think this, this is sometimes called morphological computation. I think it's totally, I, I'm totally on board with this. Like I, I, I think it's kind of everybody knows this nowadays. Um, but then there's the other claim, which is much stronger, maybe, that embodiment is required for intelligence. And I also used to be on board with this, but now I'm I'm at least a little bit less sure about this than I used to be. So I, I wanted to ask what how Josh sees this. Sure. Um, great questions, Martin. So the, the book you're referring to that Rolf and I wrote uh, was published 15 years ago. So a lot has happened in AI and robotics <laughs> in the last 15 years. Uh, morphological computation, which you mentioned, I would say is absolutely one sort of repercussion of embodied cognition. There are many, many more. And I, I tried to mention a few today that have sort of arisen over the last 15 years. Um, so I think there's there's lots there to explore. Claim number two, embodiment is necessary for intelligence. I, I think um, embodiment, robotics, xenobots, chat GPT, DALI, stable diffusion, they are doing what technology has always done, which is challenging our you know, complacency that we think we know what intelligence is. And and I, you know, Rod Brooks probably said it best. The moment something like Chat GPT comes out. A lot of people claim it isn't intelligence, intelligence is something else, right? It's just causing us to redefine what we mean by intelligence. Personally, you know, ChatGPT is a new thing under the sun. Wh whatever it is or whatever it's doing is new for us humans. Is it more intelligence than us, less intelligent, a different kind of intelligence? You know, th this is something we, you know, as society as a whole is now grappling with. So I, I, 
I wouldn't support the claim that embodiment is intelligent is necessary for intelligence because intelligence is undefined. You know, th things that have embodiment have different kinds of intelligence from things like ChatGPT, which seems to be capable of, I wouldn't say AGI, but it's very general purpose, but it makes tons of mistakes. It's it's dangerous. It doesn't know when it makes mistakes. It is simultaneously, you know, smarter and dumber than humans. It is a different kind of intelligence and it's worthy of study and clearly is already finding many, many good uses in society. When or if we ever get to, you know, embodied machines that are also useful here in the real world, we'll have the same discussion, just a different kind of intelligence. So, Martin, I'm, I'm not trying to avoid your question. I, I just think, you know, we, if we're going to ask those kind of questions, we have to be very, much more detailed in what, what kinds of intelligences we are talking about. And do we want to let them loose in society and how so? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I kind of agree. I think it's, yeah, it's a, it's a wide, there's, yeah, there's, there's a wide field of things. And I also, I don't really know what kind of intelligence GPT has, definitely has some kind of intelligence. It's pretty surprising also to me how good it is. And then in other things, it's very bad, but yeah. Well, one game I play with my students is imagine you connect ChatGPT to your car and you tell your car how you want it to drive and where you want it to go. Would you get in that car? Personally, I wouldn't. <laughs> not to cast dispersions on ChatGPT, but to again point out it's good at some things and not so good at others. And is there enough training data in the universe to make it good at all these things? I, I don't know. It's just it's just something new. It's something different. I also can't talk about the intelligence of chat gpt without a proper definition of intelligence either and i think that's true of your claim of uh embodiment uh being a requirement for intelligence that there's also many definitions of embodiment too in this case and i think that maybe a, f a few that are relevant here are that one of the things people talk about in embodiment, uh, especially with machine learning systems, is being grounded, that it's not working in some abstract symbolic space, but is actually having to deal with the consistencies and the patterns and the rules of physical nature. And I think that ChatGPT is an interesting example there because it's never interacted with driving a car. And so absolutely, Josh, I wouldn't trust it to drive my car. But it's trained on data from a bunch of human beings who are grounded in physical reality and are creating language spoken and written down that is based off of their experience. And so it's in, in some way almost indirectly grounded in the realm of language, even if it's not actually grounded in behavior space. I think that the other interesting part of the embodiment is necessary for intelligence discussion is, is uh, the take that a lot of the stems out of Rod Brooks's work, as, as Josh mentioned, and in, 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 in Elephants Don't Play Chess, I don't think that he was saying uh, morphological computation is absolutely necessary or symbol grounding is absolutely necessary. But I think that what he was talking about was that end-to-end -end systems are necessary. And at the time, machine learning relied a lot on hand-designed features and arbitrary symbols that were manipulated with one another. And he was saying, like, that's a really bad idea because that creates a lot of biases and a lot of fragile dependence on what you consider to be a symbol, how it interacts with other ones. And that was all before deep learning, which does end to end raw sensory inputs directly into motor actions or decisions. And so I think that that, that part of the embodiment is required for intelligence is one that needs a real, real rethinking in the last 15 or more years. Well, yeah. can I can I say something? Well, oh, I, I, I don't think you cannot deceive yourself. I mean, well, well I, I don't I don't care about the definition of intelligence. What I what I'm saying is, you know, these days, you know, I'm playing around with uh, Chat GPT. He can, you know, uh, you know, debug my program and then make it better. And then you know, he can, uh, you know, uh, point me some new references which I didn't know. These kind of things. I mean. 
I don't know whether the intelligence can be defined in one way or other or grounded in physics or something, but it certainly he can be a much better than, you know, sort of a, a normal assistant, you know. So uh, this practical importance is more important than the, like a definition, formal definition or anything. Don't you think so? I mean, for the last two decades, I have never, you know, for the, for the last three decades or four decades, I have not, never experienced such, you know, uh, non, you know, human assistant is highly better than, you know, uh, I mean, so that, I, that's what I'm saying. You cannot deceive yourself. I mean, this is fucking great, you know. Every day, my students, my, my colleagues, everybody is enjoying it. And I think this is because a human intelligence is coming from, you know, uh, only 10, uh, I mean, uh, 100 billion uh, neurons, right, around. And then this uh, finiteness is something which is already represented by the chat GPT. So the thing that we see here is that this uh, finiteness is out there. You know, we don't have an infinite, you know, uh, potential potential of, of something that we can understand. Already, chat GPT with this finiteness shows equivalent intelligence that we have now, right? So our intelligence is not just you know like an infinite. I mean, super something but it's already represented by this simple, simple, you know, finiteness of this um, chat GPT. So that's why people are so, you know, uh, excited and also, you know, feel very, like, like Josh said, it's, it's, it may be very, very, uh, you know, uh, scary in a, in a way that, because that's, that's us, you know, chat GPT is us, you know, our intelligence is that level not no more than that that's what we came to understand that's why we are surprising i think you know well you can, you can have a bunch of excuses but that's bruce it i think you know because it's actually helping my way of you know you know doing so it's it's it's, it's there i well so that's why that people don't care about the definition of intelligence or whatever you, you can say right it's it's there already right so i i think it's no more than that yeah maybe i mean i yeah i mean i think also it's like in some ways it's super it is super surprising so i think this also maybe responding a bit to nick it's the thing is somehow what's maybe surprising is that chat gpt learned all this only from symbols you know it actually just ate a lot of symbols <laughs> i mean basically and now it seems to actually know something like you said it seems to be grow it is at least partially it is somehow grounded no i mean like it's somehow it's not i mean of course it's not like it makes mistakes and stuff but actually it makes a lot of mistakes that are kind of similar even to humans in in many cases like it makes like when i i, I want to use it for math and it's very bad for it and like the mistakes it makes like they feel like I, mistakes that I could make, like it, it pretends it found a proof, and actually, no. If you look at it closely, it's not a proof. So I, I think like that's. The, I mean, I think yeah. That what I wanted to say is that I think the, uh, the surprising thing is how much it could learn just from symbols. I think that's super surprising. I think also on the other hand, like what you said is true. Like this whole that if you if you uh, basically back propagate through the whole system um like in reinforcement learn i think actually yeah the, the reinforcement learning deep reinforcement learning uh progress and stuff none of that actually challenged uh embodiment in my opinion like i think all these like so so i think there i agree with you but the fact that how much like this thing that Ch chat gpt learned so much just from symbols uh that is a bit surprising i mean <laughs> i think yeah Maybe, yes, please. Um, maybe um, I can jump in. Um, I'm thinking th this is um, we're entering into some uh, big um, uh, depths, deep waters here. If we, with example to the example of self-driving cars, for example, I showed I showed students this uh, video 
from the dash camera of uh, um, a self-driving car that's being tested in Tempe, Arizona, where my university is based, uh, uh, just moments before uh, a woman was killed by the car. I don't remember which company it was. I can't remember which one that was testing the car in Tempe, Arizona. Um, and it, it showed the face of the of the co-pilot, the human guy who was in the, oh, thanks, Uber, Uber, okay, name names. Uh, the the co-pilot who was sitting there, I guess he was texting or something. He looked up just at the last second and you see his face flash in horror, okay? Um, and he shows it to the students and say, well, what's the difference between the, the uh, machine learning programs that were driving the car and this guy? It's a horror. So in other words, the, the, the algorithms are, what I say, are indifferent. The technology is indifferent to the fate of the woman who was killed. And that's the key difference, right? This point about, and this brings in the notion of care. So yes, I like very much Salo's point, right? Distinction, not to confuse these different uh, notions, intelligence, consciousness, et cetera, but I also like to include care, right? Now, we don't have time, and I, I don't think anybody has, you know, like a path from uh, a set of deterministic uh, patterns or, or, or operations all the way layer by layer by layer. If you want to throw in materiality, great, and throw in some sort of um, uh, uh, embodied experience, great, but each layer is a lot of work, right? We know that to get, but we're not even, you know, at the point of talking about um, uh, 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 these other layers before we can even think about care. The other example I take is we want to start from, it depends on where we want to go. If you want to talk to the public about questions of, 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 of um, social and, uh, and ethical responsibility, then I would say start with care, right? Start with an example. My other point is from Cirque du Soleil, the big you know, circus company, it's based in Montreal where I live. Uh, they told me way back, they said that we know that we have robotic uh, pulleys that can actually more um, powerfully handle the ropes that secure our acrobats as they go through the air, but we do it manually. And so that even though the humans are less less precise, actually, and less have a latency much longer than the machine, the robotic police, et cetera, et cetera. I, and why do you do that? I say, well, because our uh, gymnasts know that if their other ends of the ropes are handled by humans, the humans will care if they die. And that's what makes all the difference in the world to this company. And at that point, they hadn't had any, they had maybe one death in many, many years of work. Okay. So, so that's another story to, to bring to this question. Now, as to embodiment, uh, I think we already brought this up in chat. It could be interesting as we're doing to truly take a close look at embodiment also. And that's why I recommended those latest edition, uh, latest translation of Merle Ponty's book, uh, Phenomenology of Perception. I also want to share a comment from, from Olaf that he wrote in the chat. Um, he thought that he, he, he likes the, this, this thought that we're indeed looking at a mirror, which is conventionally, uh, which conventionally are able to interpret directly because it's written in uh, contemporary enough natural language. Some, perhaps even a lot of it, is grounded and can be converted into coding, controlling autonomous cars, robots, and more. And he's wondering about. Oh, uh, noisy. Is it only me? Or oh. Um, oh. Ah, uh, you, you're muted, Alisa. Is it is it better now? Ah, uh, it's better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry about that. It it does that sometimes. I'm not sure why. I think it's my computer. It's not the mic. The mic's great. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I guess I'll, I'll maybe I'll restart it if it was really noisy. Um, so uh, Olaf says that he likes this thought that we're indeed looking at a mirror, which conveniently, uh, which conveniently are able to interpret directly because it's written in contemporary enough natural language. Some, perhaps even a lot of it, is grounded and can be converted into coding, controlling autonomous cars, robots, and more. What he's wondering about is this middle scale universality. That is how understandable the model can uh, uh, may remain going forward. So good point. So may, may I bring in a point again, uh, struggling uh, you again with a bit of history um, because um, while well, this was the big debate in the Middle Ages, um, 
on, in, on, and the problem of the universals, um, how language can at all represent issues in the world. So, and there were a big neglectors as the nominists to say that language does not at all represent um, things um, um, uh, in the world. And well, and this is at that time because uh, Martin, you were talking about um, uh, symbols. This is what when symbols came into the, the discourse because this was the idea. Well, uh, we have symbols which represent, and the big question was how God could be present in the world. So these were all these questions at that time. So um, this echoes always um, well in in these discussions. And the next step is Descartes. Um, um, really with the uh, bringing the mathematic symbol and decoding the world as a kind of mathematical symbol. And I recall also um, uh, Xin Wei's criticism yesterday, well, that this is completely um, um, insufficient because there are a lot of, um, 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 uh, lot of um, issues from the real world go overboard. And, um, and if I just summarize, well, um, a couple of keywords, you're always still talking in this kind of um, Descartes um, wording because you're talking about subject, you're talking about object. And um, um, the, the final question would be if we just need to um, throw this also overboard. Uh, for a coding, for a pragmatic reason, this would be quite problematic. Um, not for a philosophical. So um, there's one guy who um, who uh, brought a lot of thought in. I, I'm not. I couldn't follow all the discussions. This was William Flusser, and um, who focused um, the, the media philosopher William Flusser, who, who died at the beginning of the 90s. And he who thought a, a lot on the machine and the apparatus. Um, um, he reacted a lot about apparatus of photography and the computer as a black box and how to deal with this. This was his, his crucial message about this. And he said, well, we should focus more um, not on the object and the subject, but more on the procedure, on the process. And for him, his, this is the end of the subject. We uh, need to speak about the project. So just uh, as a short input. Yeah, really great point. Um, and, and I'm also going to read another comment you're from... Is Tim, you're muted. Is he is he still talking to us or is he in a different meeting? No, I'm not. I'm I'm finished. I just muted myself. Okay. I think I think you were lagging. <laughs> oh yeah. So um yeah, I'm I wanted to the was lagging. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're lagging, Martin. <laughs> uh so another another uh thought from Olaf. Uh he said he wants to share about the thoughts many have about intelligence and the other faucets of GPT like engines. So some of the fears that people that people currently have uh, with the feeling of keeping ourselves relevant as the future of uh, as as the future of minds on roles. He wants to question whether the question is always the right one to ask, but mostly chances are that it might not. It might just not be a choice anyone needs to make. As we've seen from biology, entities often get merged into each other to constitute new generations of organisms, or consti sorry, to constitute new generations of organisms. And our identity might merge and shift as well. So there's no, there is no strong reason to think that our future self should be limited to an appendix part. At the risk of sounding too transhumanistically optimistic, we may need to consider some symbiotic selves as a likely outcome in our mapping of technology of our technological future. Not that we can predict it anywhere close to being at, to what it accurately will be. And he thinks it'll be important. He thinks that this is important because it might help us design the right tools, which uh, make us operate mindful, enriching, wholesome shifts in designing and merging with our tools in the way that we use an abacus an intelligence augmentation rather than the way we use a calculator, which is intelligence offload. So, um, but he, yeah, so I think that's super interesting and uh, I wanted to share that with everyone. Yes, please. So maybe to tag on to that, um, I mentioned this, uh, uh, this article probably too quickly by Helga Wild, 
uh, she was kind of poking at, uh, you know, Kurt's file's uh, notion of singularity and asking, you know, at some point, uh, will our computer systems, you know, have more intelligence than some humans, et cetera, et cetera. And she was making this point that, you know, kind of saying that, well, maybe the singularity has come and gone about, you know, some tens of thousands of years ago when humans first started to work in teams to go hunting. In other words, the notion of organization already uh, was a social construct, was an organism, right, of multiple bodies that whose intelligence and capacities were greater than any individual human. Um, and then this has evolved over thousands of years into many different kinds of organizations, like, you know, governments and corporations, et cetera, et cetera, institutions, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all already all around us. This is what the STS people will tell us, right? Anthropologists will tell us and historians of technology will tell us that you know, we're surrounded by these superhuman uh, organisms already, organizations already. There's already this kind of intelligence. So yes, I say yes to what Olaf's saying. I think it will continue to evolve, that these kinds of machines, social machines are continuing to evolve. The point is, what are those operators inside? What are those, you know, uh, the widgets inside these machines, you know? And my point would be that, well, you know, the widgets we have from, from contemporary computer science are pretty primitive, actually, compared even to biological uh, things that we, as we've seen in our presentations, you know, in this workshop. So the final comment would be something about, well, what about the whole methodology? methodology? Again, going what, Lama, what I think is behind Olaf's thinking here is maybe methodologically, we can begin to, um, to um, think not inter not about intelligence or consciousness in terms of an individual um, body or robot, you know, but think of it as a function of a field, a discursive field or function of a social technical field or what have you, right? Um, and, and this is why I put in the quote in chat from, from this fellow named Calvo who wrote about plant intelligence, saying that cognition is not something that plants or indeed animals can possibly have. It's rather something created by the interaction between an organism and its environment, which is a very you know, more robust, I think, way of going about this question. And finally, I'll bring up John Searle's you know, Chinese box, right? the famous Chinese box. And when he presented it decades ago, it was supposed to be a counterexample to intelligence, right? to, to consciousness. You know, the Chinese box with the, with the, with the box that can you know, uh, uh, syntactically treat Chinese characters fed into it and give syntactically uh, you know, readable Chinese sentences back. But it's all done by table lookup. So, but it can conduct a conversation. Really, in a, you know, conceptually, to me, it's really like LMMs, really, which are a lot more sophisticated. But it's LMMs, right? So, it's a very version of that. And yet, when Searle introduced it, it was supposed to be a counterexample, right? So that's the irony that we find ourselves in today. When I look at it a little bit with a bit of amusement, right? Uh, it's not just robots, machine learning's fault, programs' fault. It's also on our side. And this is where I bring up the, the psychologist notion of uh, apophenia, that a human um, uh, pro uh, uh, propensity <laughs> for, for ascribing meaning to even random patterns. So it takes two to make this illusion. I think that's great. And uh, Sala, uh, I, just, be, just before, I, I, want, I also wanted to follow up um, uh, with that, um, there's this great book I'm, I'm always bringing up these days. It is a trilogy called Children of Time. And uh, this theme of, of what intelligence is, is explored over and over again as something as a process that happens in different mediums. And I think one example that was brought up in these, in these books was really cool, uh, was this idea of an ant colony um, able to perform computations and even react in an intelligent way. Yet in every individual ant, there's not a sense of real, you know, agency or intelligence and just in the individual ants. But the interaction between all the ants is something that is what's carrying the computation and uh, and and everything. So um, solo really quick. And then I think we're going to wrap up here. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave this as a thought and a thought exercise. So Alicia and I have been talking um, for a couple of years now about consciousness and um, how it could emerge um, and what are the components of it. And recently we have been thinking about um, what if we, we imbued the AI with the notion of um, time and episodic memory as to create um, a kind of subjective experience. So 
Zin, sorry if I'm, or Sha, sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, um, talked about how machines don't care. So I, I think there are two components that are necessary if we are ever going to implement that. One is an ocean, an intrinsic notion of causality. And the other is um, something that, apart from um, an intrinsic purpose, um, they would need to in some way relate to us. So if we want them to care and see um, our existence as important, they should have a notion of subjective experience. And we've been thinking that uh, a key component of that is having an episodic memory and not uh, simply simply having the AI know a lot of facts, but knowing when it came in contact with those facts, how it evolved over time, how it learned, uh, what were the consequences of uh, each new knowledge that came in. So it's a whole metadata layer on top of the facts that um, adds the experience of learning those facts. And we think that can unlock a lot of things. Um, yeah, let's see. I'm eager to start the research, actually. So, yeah, I'll leave that as a thought exercise. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how um, different, uh, I don't know, like, I guess what we would call variables or um, symbols uh, encode it as a part of some sort of language get encoded. And it's all it's all super interesting and we want something that is, is always an underlying theme and has been an underlying theme throughout this entire workshop. So, yeah, with that, I think um, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. This has been so much fun. It's been a really great discussion. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share the uh, or, sorry, copy paste the chat into the Discord, and then I will also share the link just in case um, you know you haven't joined the Discord yet, and that way we can continue the conversation. So um, thank you all once again for, for this wonderful discussion and for the wonderful talks. Yay. Give, thank you, too. Give everybody a round of applause. Yay. This is super good. All right. So um, Thank you all, uh, YouTube. We are going to close it and we are going to close the workshop. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for seeing the video after it's been recorded as well for those of you who are watching us in the future. All right. See you all later for another exciting uh, event uh, at Cross Labs. Bye. <laughs>